Should we start on time? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. You could. It's it's recorded. It's recorded, it's recorded anyway. Yes. So. <clears throat> All right. So maybe, maybe I will have you introduce yourself a little bit. There. Who, who are you? Um. So my name is Ravi Bhatt. I'm a research associate at Dr. Zeltzer. I'm a recently graduated from Ohio State. Um. Okay, all right, and then Monica? Um, my name is Monica Lipinska, I come from Krakow, Poland. I have finished my doctoral school last year. It's one year internship and came back here to learn more about integrated distance medicine. I did a scholarship at the UCLA two years ago and then I met Dr. Huey. I did a course in integrated distance medicine and I think it's like a great way and great combination I would like to learn more and apply it in my you're going back? I'm going back, yes. Yeah. Okay. But she's just using the uh, three and a half weeks uh, to come here, just to get more exposure, to get the, she came here as a fourth year med student, mm -hmm. uh, which I think has been going on for 20 some years. And uh, we have been teaching uh, this, and that's why all my junior faculty have gone through the fourth year course mm -hmm. and residency rotation. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think that uh, I'm just, looking at her as maybe another one of my seeds planted in Europe. <laughs> so, Crystal, you know, uh, Beijing, she came uh, five, six years ago as uh, uh, someone from, you know, the China Academy, where Dr. Yao got a Nobel Prize, okay? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so she was with me for three, three months, and now she's here for a whole year, and she's ready to go back. Oh, wow. So she's uh, she's going to give a talk if she's really interested. East West approach to infectious disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's uh, part of uh, you know, her interest. Mm -hmm. So let me just uh, try to kind of uh, talk about uh, how I got involved in this. And uh, Professor Jiang Hua is actually from Shanghai. Uh, she's going to be part of this Friday talk on looking at East-West approach to liver disease. But this year's Nobel Prize went to Zhou Yo Yo, and uh, so she represented one of the uh, members of the group in China that uh, were recruited or mandated by the Chinese government who are Western scientists, physicians, to learn what is in Chinese medicine and deal with new medicine. So uh, she was the one who uh, is in the China Academy of Chinese Medical Sciences, who basically, uh, uh, in the, uh, I would say, 70s, worked on the project to find a new drug for malaria. So she discovered artemisinin, and from that, you know, uh, uh, she had a Nobel Prize. First, the last award first. I, I interviewed her, I have a project that I interviewed many of these pioneers in China who have done integrated medicine over the last 60 years. So many of these people are 80 years old, 80 some years old. Some already have died, they have 90s. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I interviewed her in 2007 and I, I, I put it on the, our web portal and then the YouTube, you know, uh, because see, I translated, you know, her, uh, her uh, uh, the process of her discovery in terms of how to extract that drug. But again, there are many, many more yet to come because most people in the Western world don't know much about what Chinese medicine you know, can offer to the world. And that's why I'm working on, I'm working on a, a, a commentary. Uh, after she got the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, anyway, 1971 uh, is when uh, China uh, opened up to the Western world. So uh, I was uh, I was a young medical student. Actually, I was at UCLA since 1968, 69. It's a chemistry major. My interest at the time was like to yo yo, okay, inspired by the discovery of ephedrine from Ma Wang. So I came here as a chem major to study natural product chemistry. But 1971 was a region scholarship for UCLA Medical School. I get exposed to this, okay? So, so I, I saw acupuncture being performed 
on a patient during open chest you know, surgery. Okay, someone is wide awake eating, and I, if you're interested, you can go to our web portal and look at the video. So that was me studying Western medicine at UCLA, all the books, right, plus the acupuncture model. Okay, so I learned acupuncture, I learned Chinese medicine concurrently. I, I basically uh, spent my free time during medical school you know, to learn Chinese medicine, to learn Chinese medicine in Chinese, Chinese Western medicine in Chinese, modern science in Chinese, and try to integrate with what is uh, thrown at me at UCLA Medical School. So I think that's an important background. Okay, so well, how do I go on to do integrated medicine? So, so I finished medical school. Said, well, I, I need to do internal medicine because internal medicine is the most comprehensive approach to health and disease based on pathophysiology. And Chinese medicine is based on pathophysiology. And that, uh, and I saw a lot of, uh, and I also want to develop new drugs, right? I saw a lot of drug-induced diseases. And, uh, and I know that you need to use uh, non-drug therapy to decrease drug-induced diseases. And uh, so that was me as a house staff, okay? Many of, some of these people have passed away. You know, David Solomon was my chief of medicine. You know, uh, he, uh, he obviously passed away a couple of years ago. But I have, I have many, many important people in my life that have inspired me, okay? And uh, so I, I became a clinical pharmacologist, and that was a new discipline. I built clinical pharmacology clinically. I was chief of clinical pharmacology at the, at the bedside. I did consultation on all the sick people within UCLA, and, uh, and I taught clinical pharmacology for 13 years at UCLA. So as a way to integrate Western medicine, I've done bench research. I work on beta receptor, alpha receptor regulation. I developed new drugs, and uh, so so basically, I actually Barbara Levy uh, served on the same committee with me on the American Society of Clinical Pharmacy Therapeutics to teach doctors around the country how to do, to use drugs more you know rationally. Okay, so so that's why it was uh, a bit of a. Uh, a bit of a, uh, a shock for Barbara Levy to say, gee, what are you doing? Doing this thing that you are doing? I mean, I was a card carrying, you know, I published in New England Journal in 1981. You know, I published in science journals, but I want to do this because see, this to me has implications for the world at many, many different levels, okay? So I'm not talking about one disease or one group of diseases. I'm talking about the whole of medicine. So, so that's, what, that's what I talk about at that time, the importance of integrating traditional Chinese and Western medicine was in San Francisco, 1992. And uh, so that was really before I launched the Center for East West Medicine. I could not intellectually stay on doing what I'm doing at UCLA, the usual stuff. <laughs> so, so that's sort of, uh, that's what I did. Okay, so I went to my, my mentor, Dean Mellencourt, who, who has been mentored for me since 1972. He is the basically guru of Western medicine, father of UCLA health sciences. He built UCLA medical school from a new medical school in the 60s until the time he retired as uh, the longest reigning dean of all time. So that made UCLA to be one of the most renowned sort of uh, institutions in the world. So that's what he's, he, his letter, you know, he wrote his letter in 1994. Okay, right after I launched the center. Mm -hmm. and, and it has been my inspiration, okay? Sure, mental education, research, but cost-effective care already at that time, 94, and then compassionate care of patients, but most, and prevention, but most importantly, we talk about synergistic application principles originating in Eastern and Western civilizations. That to me is the most insightful statement because most people in the Western world they think that, well, let's use what we have to examine, you know, Eastern medicine, okay? When in fact, there's a lot that the Western world can learn from the principles emanating from the healing traditions of, you know, Chinese civilization, Eastern civilization. So that has shaped my whole career. So first of all, the dream of building this new medicine model basically, in, you know, kind of uh, inspired me to go through the first 22 years to integrate Western medicine, to try to understand sort of uh, uh, what Chinese medicine is all about, 
how the two can be put together, where they overlap, where they differ, and at the same time, how you can create something better in terms of uh, effectiveness, in terms of safety, but also cost effectiveness. That to me is really what is uh, uh, shaping my uh, development of the center. So rather than focusing on research, well, I've done enough research, that's why the last 20 some years I've done a lot of research, band research, you know, outcomes research, clinical research, okay. But what I want is to build a, a health model that would you know, provide healthcare that is safe, effective, affordable, and accessible. So my, my work currently is now globalization of what I've learned from my clinical laboratory at the bedside, okay? Not disease by disease or not, uh, but, ba but basically. So with the blessing of uh, Dr. Fogelman, another one of my you know, inspiration, he let me do it. But obviously, UCLA did not have much money back in the time of 1993-4. It was the, uh, the recession mm -hmm. at that time. But I built this like over the last 20 years. You know, many of these you know, uh, uh, components on our center, but most people probably know a little bit about our clinical program. And I would like to go over that a little bit because if you want to do research in integrated medicine, you need to understand the model, okay? Uh, and, and so UCLA is blessed with many components of integrated medicine and uh, obviously uh, over the next uh, uh, few weeks, you'll be here uh, hearing, you know, lectures, presentations from uh, the uh, uh, pediatric pain program. Dr. Lonnie Sales will come, you know, later on, and then uh, and then the Tillish, uh, Kristen Tillish from uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, Center for Neurobiology of Stress will be coming, and then. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Michael Urban from Psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, but I think there's some new, obviously, uh, uh, very interesting areas, like obviously Helen, who's uh, the, 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 the main person organizing all these uh, presentations, who will be speaking on, you know, uh, on what, depression and anxiety using- Mood uh, disorders. Uh, mood disorders uh, in general. And then uh, I'm most interested in Dr. Murrow's uh, The Science of uh, Lifestyle Medicine, also very, very you know, uh, important and interesting as well. Uh, so, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, so integrated medicine is, is not just at UCLA, it's uh, actually uh, being you know, developed you know, in now more than 60 uh, plus academic health centers. And that, uh, so UCLA is part of that consortium, and, and I will go over a little bit about what is really uh, the definition of the integrated medicine defined by you know, uh, uh, the academic consortium of integrated health and medicine. Uh, and they have accepted besides medical schools some big, large health systems as well. Uh, and that uh, the focus is to you know, reaffirm the relationship between patients and also practitioners and dealing with the whole patient. Uh, so these are some of the uh, main components of uh, how people define integrated medicine. There's patient-centered, individualized, probably at the, both at the uh, uh, clinical level, whole person level, all the way to genomics, you know, uh, pharmacogenomics and so on. Uh, the holistic approach uh, and utilizing all appropriate therapeutic modalities and over the next, uh, few weeks, uh, you'll be exposed to uh, uh, many of the modalities, particularly uh, uh, through uh, Dr. Celsius' program, because he is linked up with many, many uh, of the uh, <coughs> sort of uh, <coughs> professionals from different disciplines. As a matter of fact, uh, Ron gave her a talk, so I don't know what he told you. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, anyway, I think most importantly, and I want to emphasize this point, Leveraging the body's ability to heal itself through self-care. Now, what do you mean by healing yourself? Okay, we in Western medicine, I'm a clinical pharmacologist. We label that component the placebo response. Okay, so basically, when you use non-drug therapy, most often times you work through enhancing the body's ability to re-regulate. Okay, and but in Western medicine, we want to look at the specific etiology. Factor that we try to treat, 
And, and that's why uh, it's a lot easier when something is missing and when you replace it. But when you are talking about blocking and stimulating, it's not that simple to show. Uh, when you do a bug early, then you can show you know, uh, the, the, the specific etiology. But oftentimes when the body is already in a, a disarray pathophysiologically, uh, your specific etiology approach is not going to be that adequate. So, so these are some of the other er areas that people talk about, informed by evidence, not just RCT, not just meta you know, analysis or something like review, but you need to look at all evidence, okay? <clears throat> so I was a visiting professor at Stanford for a whole day, and they interviewed me about my views on integrated medicine, and uh, you, you know, I, I don't have much time to talk you know, too much about integrated medicine. And, and I think it's important for people to know about uh, different clinical models. And uh, I think most, most, I would say, uh, approaches, uh, clinical models, uh, I would define as international buffet, uh, <laughs> that you can sample different approaches. Whereas what I try to, because it's tough enough to integrate Western medicine. Western medicine, if you are an internist, you are already integrating already all the different approaches. But when you add on to many of the other approaches, uh, so uh, with Chinese medicine, you have acupuncture, you have Tai Chi Qi Gong, you have massage, you have herbal medicine. So to, to me, to just to try to integrate these two large healing traditions, is already Western medicine and Chinese medicine, already very, very complicated. Uh, but at least this is what I attempt to do, is to create that clinical model. So the, in general, I use uh, Western medicine to look at the trees and the branches and the roots and make sure that you know, I am able to address it you know, when there's good evidence and it's safe to do. And I use Chinese medicine to look at the forest. Okay? And you use the two to basically look at both at the same time and allow you to have a more comprehensive view of how to approach you know, a tough clinical problem. So, so that's really you know, what I try to keep emphasizing. Using, because you need to look at the whole. You're going to solve a complex problem you need to look at the whole. But you cannot miss you know, uh, really the local. The local is also very important, particularly it's life threatening. So uh, you can go to our website and kind of look at how we build this sort of uh, east-west uh, framework. Uh, and I kind of uh, emphasized this a little bit earlier, just a, 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 a derivative of like you know, some of the components of integrated medicine that different uh, uh, experts within the field, you know, uh, <clears throat> try to sort of uh, uh, guide their, their, their approach. So the reason why I want to kind of go over the clinical model is that when you want to do research, and that's why when some of the fellows, PhD fellows who come through our clinic, I want them to really understand what really is integrated medicine. Otherwise, you're not doing the real research, okay? You need to understand the the basically uh, the various uh, approaches and components, but that now you know I want to appeal to anyone who is interested to do research is that we have three clinics right now. Uh, we are, we basically have uh, more than twenty thousand patient visits a year, and uh, we have referral from more than five hundred physicians within the UCLA system, and most patients already fail state of art Western medicine for their individual diseases. But in general, we uh, use the whole patient center approach to try to see what we can do. <clears throat> so the, we, we have collected data over 10 years and we, we, we have you know, been looking at the, the, the economic cause of uh, uh, just low back pain, but basically uh, these are the type of patients in general, there are you know, a lot of patients with pain conditions, but they may come in with dizziness, they may come in with uh, other concomitant diseases. And because I'm an internist, I'm also in, uh, boss certified in geriatrics, my interest is the, how this model, as I take care of this patient with pain, or fatigue, or the depression, or the anxiety, how would this affect the other diseases? And many of the patients who come in with many drugs, once they use this, you know, uh, uh, go through this model, and, and, and we are lucky, then these patients may not be able to, I mean, not need to take too many of these medications. Okay. So, young patients too, it's not just people in geriatric, that's the reason why I'm taking my work to primary care and have my own son, who is a UCLA biochemist, medicine, internal medicine, geriatrics, to build a primary care program because I want to take my work 
you know, maybe even to pediatrics or maybe to prenatal area because many of the seeds of ill health planted very early on. But uh, so patients come in, if you have 10 different diseases, well, you can do research on one of each one of these diseases. Okay, you find a new approach, new drug. But what about the other diseases? Unless you solve all of them together, one aggravation of one disease would bring on the other. So that to me is really why it's important to try to look at what William Osler have taught us. This is the father of modern medicine, okay? It's much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of disease of a patient. Basically, right now, the most approach is treating a disease or different diseases in that person. But realistically, you need to treat the person with one disease and using the, the approach that I think uh, employed by most of the people working in integrated medicine that look at the whole would have a better chance for solving some of these very complex problems. So I don't want to kind of go too detailed into the clinical approach, but again, history taking, go back to the root of medicine, what really is that? History taking, look at people's childhood experiences, look at their work, uh, look at their uh, psychosocial uh, trauma, their uh, uh, physical trauma, uh, the nutrition, the lifestyle, uh, which many of these will be covered later on. Uh, <clears throat> So the physical examination, obviously, uh, good East and West, and that education is very important. That's why in our research, besides the modality, you need to use sort of ways to help change patients to understand what they are uh, facing with, what they can do for themselves, what the health system can do for them, how they need to change their lifestyle, uh, how to exercise, uh, the importance of sleep, what to eat, and also our nutrition is also East-West type of nutrition to teach people how to eat according to their pattern, how to do the, uh, the look at their posture, uh, the self-massage, the acupressure, and then obviously stress management would, would be you know, covered throughout you know, the next few weeks of discussion, uh, presentations here, but then so acupuncture, most people think that we are running an acupuncture clinic, but in fact, you know, UCL has a pain, you know, program for 30 years uh, with acupuncture as part of the component. But unless you use acupuncture as, a, as part of Chinese medicine, look at the whole system and bring in all the relevant components of Chinese medicine to allow, you know, uh, acupuncture, you know, like stimulation. You can see, I'm supposed to talk about acupuncture as part of my talk, you know. But acupuncture to me is basically a way to stimulate the body to redirect the way. Okay, so neuroscience actually the last 40 years, you know, uh, through you know uh, a, a lot of the work by you know many of the neuroscientists have now you know allow us to have a better understanding about the neuroscience of acupuncture, which uh, again is very important that you can modulate the vagal system that is involved in the inflammatory cascade. You can not just release endorphins, or you can work on the nitric oxide system, but, but understanding the ancient wisdom of how acupuncture is used by the Chinese for thousands of years, but also understand the newer science of acupuncture, you can put it together. Uh, and then understanding about trigger points, how trigger points relates to you know, acupuncture points, how it relates to sort of uh, the fascia, okay? There's a lot of science on the uh, science of fascia that link many of these you know, approaches together. That also explain why stretching, why massage is useful. And obviously, as a clinical pharmacologist, you know, I use to teach people how to use drugs. Right now, I say, well, how not to use drugs and how also you can taper drugs safely. So, so basically, this is our clinical model. So if you want to do research, think about how to do research with my clinical model because it obviously is multiple component. It's not the usual single drug you know, uh, placebo control trial. So you need to use, and I'm gonna talk about using my uh, uh, first presentation to give you some of the new innovative methodologies to, to do research in Chinese medicine or, or, or integrated medicine. 
So obviously prevention is also something that we uh, you know, try to emphasize, not so much in terms of vaccination or uh, uh, prevention, but, but really uh, think about prognostically, think about how to teach people you know, what to do, how to dress, you know, how to sort of, uh, 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 when you get trauma, how do you, you know, deal with it right away? I mean, there are many, many aspects. So the idea about prevention is, uh, again, you know, can be a whole, you know, lecture of course by itself. And, and again, what I'm trying to say is that East and West, there's a lot of overlap. But basically, there's a lot of East that I think the West have not been able to, you know, get into because of the translation issue. So now I go back to, you know, uh, camp because most of the uh, people uh, who may be listening, you know, uh, to our presentations may not know so much about uh, what is complementary alternative medicine. Well, what is usually not taught, you know, in uh, the main required cause of, you know, most medical schools, you know, in general have been called, you know, camp or complementary alternative medicine. But now, after 20 some years, a lot of us, you know, at least those of us at UCLA, had been moving this into the curriculum. But that, uh, but the most important thing is to, uh, this is almost like the definition of 20 years ago now, yeah, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, uh, is uh, that most patients, are, uh, particularly in the west side, if you work in the west side, you know that most patients want this type of, of care. And that, uh, uh, and I think it's very important not, not just to meet their needs, but also to diversify the conceptual framework of medicine. Okay, and that's really where I, I would say uh, uh, the other approaches, you know, uh, the, the, the more systemic approach to problem is important. So this is the old NIH classification of the various approaches. We pick traditional Chinese medicine uh, just because it has a theoretical, you know, construct that govern the practice of acupuncture, of qigong, tai chi, diet, herbs, and manual therapy. It, it's basically a physical construct. Now, what is a physical construct? It's emphasizing, uh, well, this is uh, the camp, but I would, I would talk about you know, Chinese medicine as an example later on. But I think it's very important for us you know, as scientists to think about what is our approach in terms of you know, framing a problem. Okay, the Western medicine model in general is reductionistic. Okay, so so it's is a holistic versus you know reductionistic. I mean, you try to figure out how to approach a problem by from a symptom to a, an organ to a tissue to a disease to a cell or molecule. Okay, to remove, to block, to stimulate. Okay, uh, to replace. So. So I think it's kind of very important that now Western medicine is moving to systems biology, but again, it's still at a biological level and not at a comprehensive system, systemic approach. And, and as we talk about a health system, and you can see that now, you know, uh, we are trying to put the various molecules back together of the, of the components in Western medicine into a system, okay? So emphasize on wellness, obviously. Now, whenever you try to save people's lives with surgery and drugs, sometimes you know, they have to go through a lot of you know, adverse you know, side effects. You know. uh, but then sometimes after you suffer, you get well, okay? But in general, that's, that's the reason why I think uh, CAM approaches are most suitable for our patient and population health. And, and that, that's, that to me is really, but then it can also be very helpful even in the ICU as well. The self-healing mechanism I, I mentioned about this earlier is basically in Western medicine, in general, with drug you know development, we talk about the placebo placebo response. Okay, and if you think about surgery, the wound healing is the self-healing mechanism. Okay, oftentimes you know uh, uh, you just lands you know a wound or many of, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about this point because it's very important. A lot of people basically do not have a good understanding about the whole placebo response. And, and that's the work of Ted Ketchup at Harvard right now. Many people now are looking at the placebo response, which is really an important component of healing. So, uh, you know, bioenergy, obviously, energy medicine has been around, and now uh, sort of Kevin's, you know, uh, uh, Stacy, uh, 
can't remember now. Okay, he Tracy Kevin Tracy has now been moving into using stimulation of the vagal nerve as a way to try to uh, uh, treat or using electrical therapy to treat the laser is you know by energy. But all these years in Western medicine, we've been using basically surgery and also drugs. Okay, so the, the energy therapy has not been as mainstream yet, uh, but will be. And nutrition, obviously, not just uh, uh, you know average type of you know nutrition. And I think that there's always confusion in what people should be eating. Uh, but I think that right now there's some consensus of obviously information is bad. We need to cut down on information. But that realistically, it's important that it's very important to you know before we get uh, you know uh, uh, neutral genomics or, uh, or nut nutritional genetics you know data coming in. I think the Chinese model of you know, looking at a pattern, looking at a phenotype, and then you know use you know uh, uh, food product as a way to reverse the abnormal you know uh, uh, biochemistry. <clears throat> And then the idea about individuality, which is really the characteristic of complexity science. So traditional Chinese medicine has been around. I mean, I, I know that people are just beginning to recognize that, oh, well, Tou Yoyo just got a Nobel Prize from you know, uh, this uh, herb you know, uh, uh, <coughs> that had been used for 1,700 years for malaria. But that's really the tip of the iceberg of what one can get from Chinese herbal medicine. Uh, because most people in the Western world begin to understand a little bit about acupuncture over the last you know, 40 some years of uh, introduction to the West again. Uh, but herbal medicine is much more than finding a new drug from the herbal farm here, uh, from China. But that is the, is the way how diagnoses are made, when the system is very complex, how you design an herbal formula uh, to match the, the, the system need in terms of dealing with symptoms, dealing with uh, the, the main part of physiology, and dealing with the root of the problem. The root of the problem, obviously, is the body's not able to heal itself. Okay? That is the, really why I think Chinese medicine is very important in terms of uh, really the weakness of Western medicine. Western medicine is very good you know, uh, to try to control the symptoms, but realistically, uh, that's why you go by management. You have to keep using the same drug, you know, all the time. But if you allow the body to take care of itself, then you need to take, you know, use the, you know, uh, the the medications, you know, uh, on a daily basis. But that's, you know, again another <laughs> lecture by itself. So this is a Chinese medical model uh, when <clears throat> there's no separation of body and the mind. And, and and I'm glad that right now psychoneuroimmunology, psychoneuroendocrinology of bringing back you know, uh, the mind and the body together, and, and how this relates to the natural environment and also the social environment and its, its interaction. Uh, so, so to me, <clears throat> to try to solve a complex problem, you need to look at you know, the system in a very comprehensive way. <clears throat> and one, one of the uh, clinical approach of Chinese medicine is to look at a pathophysiological pattern, okay? And I, I don't like the Chinese translation, you know, that's why people from Beijing or Shanghai use the word symptom complex. To me, it doesn't mean anything. Chinese medicine is based on pathophysiology. Basically, it talks about balance. These are three major words in Chinese medicine. Balance, flow. Without balance, your flow is either impeded or abnormal, and then and then the most important thing is that you need to have the you know, functional reserve to maintain the flow and the balance. And that leads to the chronic fatigue. Unless you treat the chronic, the body's ability to heal itself. That's, that is the most important contribution of Chinese medicine to the, the Western thinking that how can you, first of all, prevent by improving the body's ability to adapt to stress, and you call it probably re, uh, resilience, right? But the other is to, try to see, well, even when you are depleted, how do you reverse it? How do you, so, but again, you need to take care of, you know, the symptom, but also the root. Sometimes you need to take care of both at the same time. So the pattern, there are different type of patterns. The patterns will tell you whether this is the flow problem. Uh, you can flow at the blood, vest, blood uh, level, then you have stroke and MI. 
The Chinese recognize it at a very early stage, okay? But they also take it to the next earlier level at the so-called qi level. The qi level to me in general is just like spasm, okay, of muscles or whatever. So, so anyway, uh, important to look at, and we have patterns in Western medicine too, okay? We have DIC, we have sy systemic inflammatory response you know, uh, syndrome, uh, we have, you know, hyperandrogenic state, okay? So it's just terminology. You, you can use Chinese medicine to allow you to look at what else, you know, you can treat with, you know, because that's why it's so easy for us to teach 4 PMS students. We teach them what, what you know, uh, the overlap is, just by having the right translation at the scientific level. And what are the differences? And why you need to learn the difference to allow you to have a, a better way to conceptualize the problem and also to know how best to use some of the tools to re-regulate the system and repeat the system. That to me is the fundamental thing. Re-regulate and repeat. So again, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter how many diseases you are coming in. I look at you, I say, well, you know, wh wh where, where is the imbalance? Where is the flow problem? Why are you so depleted? So that, again, you need to go back to lifestyle. You need to go back to appropriate work rest. You need to teach people how to adapt to the environment. You need to deal with the, try to help them to deal with the social stress. How to minimize the, the trauma. Driving in 405 is like micro trauma every day. Uh, but again, a lot of people have trauma of enormous uh, uh, proportions, you know, from getting bullied, you know, have the falls from, uh, from car wrecks, you know. I mean, we're not talking about Gulf War or uh, people coming back from Iraq. But again, infection is another trauma. The body fought off. It's like, you know, this bombing. You're bombing, you know, uh, uh, Iraq, and now you have to do how to rebuild. So again, Chinese medicine is very good to help you rebuild the system. So the goal of treatment is very simple. Just deal with uh, balance and deal with flow. You individualize and you focus on enhancing the body's uh, homeostatic reserve. So, a few words about acupuncture before we get into the, the research, okay? So, and I, I basically uh, uh, try to demonstrate to people that I can massage your hand and your neck will get better, okay? I teach them how to do that all the time, right? <clears throat> so, a lot of myths about acupuncture. If you go just uh, look at uh, the thousands of papers published in acupuncture, there are lots of research. And people say, well, there's no data. And there's lots of data. It's just that you have to spend your time you know, learning about it. It's just that uh, an acupuncture is no better than placebo. No, it is like enhancing the placebo response. All right? And, and uh, I'll say a few words about sham acupuncture uh, a little bit. Uh, and then and acupuncture is more than just uh, using it for pain relief. It has been used to treat, I would say, with good data, you know, dozens of diseases, but uh, can be adjunctive in many, many diseases, particularly for stress management, for some pain control, for nausea and vomiting. Uh, and we're bringing this work actually to the hospital, you know, help people get out of the hospital a lot quicker. And that, uh, and that uh, uh, we have been training a lot of uh, people uh, who are not going to school for four years to get a degree in acupuncture. So acupuncture, you know, uh, basically uh, restores the homeostatic uh, balance uh, by suppressing hyperfunction and stimulating hypofunction and regulating disturbed function. Uh, a, a, a nice paper in the American Journal of Gastroenterology 23 years ago. Uh, but you want to look at the new science of uh, acupuncture, analgesia, you go read in 1982, and a review of pharmacology, uh, written by the Nobel Prize winner, you know, uh, uh, who did discover endorphins, and also Professor Han ji Sang, who is you know the top person in China doing research on acupuncture and analgesia. So there are many different ways to stimulate acupuncture points. Uh, to me, surgery has a component of like acupuncture, and that's why you know when they do OA at the knee. Uh, uh, surgery to compare surgery to lavaging the knee to lick, licking a wound close to the knee joint. In New England Journal, they published a paper showing that there's no difference in the positive outcome. So the common denominator is to stimulate, you know, close to 
your area. Uh, so right now, we because we have so many people waiting for several months to get in, we teach many of our patients to use the TENS unit, but on acupuncture points. Mm -hmm. uh, trigger point overlaps with acupuncture points in multiple ways, so uh, in like 70 to 80, 90 percent. So, so we use that quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> so again, go to uh, look at the, the neuroscience, uh, hyperstimulation, analgesia, endorphins, uh, and all the neurotransmitters has been studied. Uh, functional MRI has uh, uh, also <clears throat> looked at it. We did a video, you can go to our web portal, 21 minutes uh, acupuncture, research and clinical applications from east to west. And uh, we interviewed some of the, we are clipping the original sort of patients going through open chest surgery, eating orange or sipping orange juice, okay? Uh, but uh, we also talk about going forward how to do you know, uh, research and how people in the, the world are doing research in acupuncture. And obviously, clinically, uh, besides using it in uh, hospitals, but uh, the, the VA and now obviously the Army, uh, even all the way to the NATO, are using, you know, teaching men the medics acupuncture for pain control at least. So let's talk about research. <clears throat> so what is evidence in contemporary global medical settings. I think beyond thinking of evidence as proof, it's not important to think that evidence is one aspect of efforts to improve healthcare through research on a global scale. The lifestyle of evidence has to be considered prior to the design and implementation of any research. Dissemination education, you know, taking it to the community, obviously, is a crucial part of this life cycle. Making evidence relevant in the contemporary <clears throat> global healthcare landscape requires innovative methods, as well as unique interdisciplinary research teams. The concept of translation science is helpful in thinking through the evidence in life cycle, particularly, you know, uh, as I know to talk about it, applied to Chinese medicine. Now, this is the usual the usual uh, uh, way in the Western world that we think about clinical translation science. We, we start in the lab, and then we try to go to animals, and then go to humans, and then you do the trial, and then you try to teach, and then you disseminate into the community. Okay, that's a long, long you know, uh, journey. Now, one way to think about some of these uh, thousand year old therapies is that well it's been used in thousands and millions and hundreds of millions of people. You have a lot of this evidence. And now you can go back and try to look at, you know, using some of the, the methodology that I'm going to introduce to think about how to try to get you know from this big data information and guide you to figure out how best to design your subsequent type of study. Okay. So, just a few words. I mean, I, you know, about acupuncture research, and, and I give you some background about you know acupuncture. And obviously, if you use the sort of uh, uh, the current way of thinking about research, you know, they, or if you look at top frame review, you always say, well, the design problem, the sample size problem, obviously, other factors problem. It's usually insufficient evidence. Yeah. But that's you know, good. That kills me. No, because it's always <laughs> good to keep the research points coming. To, to, for us to keep doing research with it, okay? Well, in the, in the meantime, a lot of patients, you know, are already doing it, you know? So, there's also inherent difficulties in designing appropriate controls, such as placebos and sham acupuncture groups. And, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about one of the studies that we, that we did on acupuncture and mental stress. Uh, so, again, in 1997, the NIH published a consensus statement Know, and these are the limited, you know, uh, uh, diseases that they listed that have, you know, adequate, you know, evidence not from just from RCT but you know meta-analysis and review that you can use it for post-op in chemotherapy, nausea, vomiting, uh, and post-op dental pain, and then, you know, useful in many of the other, you know, uh, diseases or symptoms, you know, uh, but. Uh, 
So there's a society for acupuncture research and by scientists you know, with rigorous you know, background and, uh, and uh, they have a you know, meeting you know, every uh, uh, biannual at conferences. Uh, and you know, just kind of a show you some mechanistic studies uh, because I think it's important to know that a lot of basic science you know, approach, you know, people have looked at you know, uh, uh, sham acupuncture, meaning you, rather than using acupuncture points that's supposed to treat a particular disease, uh, you can just stick needles in, in you know, different areas and then see what happens. And you know, people have applied you know, uh, uh, new imaging to, you know, to study you know, this particular you know, question. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why clinically uh, this point, you know, that uh, most people uh, have been taught to, to, to massage or to stimulate in the second metacarpal is that when you put needle there, it modulates the limbic system, you know, uh, and uh, uh, using functional MRI. So for most people who are ill, they all have some aspect of stress. So that's why for us, you know, except for those people who may be pregnant, we would teach them how to stimulate, you know, this acupuncture point because it will be good for pain, particularly things in the face, and also decrease stress. Now, we actually uh, have done a couple of studies using acupuncture uh, to see how it would inhibit uh, sympathetic activation during mental stress. Uh, we apply it to normals and also apply it to people with advanced heart failure. And that uh, <clears throat> uh, in, in this study, uh, I mean, we basically uh, use three approaches. One is to use acupuncture point and uh, in the setting that's supposed to decrease stress. We also stick needles in areas that supposedly not to do anything. But again, when you stick needles into someone, the body will mind and the simple response. Okay, so for pain control, that most people talk about sham acupuncture. Most sham acupuncture in general may may in, involve like kind of penetration of something or a painful stimulus. So what we did actually a third group, we used the acupuncture uh, uh, guy as a plastic, and we just tap on the patient's back, and they didn't know. So there are three groups, and what we have found is that uh, you know, using the, the point specific for stress decreased you know, uh, sympathetic ex excitation. And that, uh, and that, uh, and there's a gradation uh, between the group, you know, uh, with the specific points and the group with the so-called sham points and then the group that do not have, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, skin penetration. And there's really no pain uh, stimulus. So there are different types of acupuncture clinical trials. Again, there are hundreds of clinical trials, and there's some good good studies. Uh, so I talk about acupuncture versus sham acupuncture. Now, if there's needle penetration, I would say that what you're comparing, we're comparing is basically two sets of points. You have to tell me why you select that particular group of points and different experts will be using different points according to what, <clears throat> not just the disease, but what the pattern is. So that's why most of the people <clears throat> in oriental medicine don't care too much about the curve research done you know, uh, this way because it's not really applying the sort of uh, the, the medicine in you know, use you know, in, the, in their world. Uh, but uh, when you say you use acupuncture, uh, you have to define what set of points you're using. So you're comparing only two sets of points. It's like you're comparing two drugs, two NSAIDs, and you say two NSAIDs, they have no difference, okay? Doesn't mean that it's a placebo, okay? So I think it's very important. A lot of people read, read oh, they're all the sham, there's no difference from sham. But sham by itself has effect, okay? And uh, I think it's good to just, you know, Acupuncture versus standard therapy. But again, uh, most people with ethic, you know, considerations may not want to do that. But acupuncture plus standard treatment versus standard treatment alone, or acupuncture versus no treatment, or wait list. Okay. 
So uh, Brian Berman, you know, published a paper, God, you know, 11, 12 years ago in Annals of Internal Medicine uh, using acupuncture for OA of the knee. 570 patients randomized and uh, 23 true acupuncture versus 26 weeks, over 26 weeks versus 23 sham acupuncture, uh, even with the sham needle penetration, okay, uh, there is uh, improvement. That's why most insurance companies now approve acupuncture for OA of the knee. How about low back pain? Again, you know, 10 years ago, uh, is, uh, and that doesn't matter, analysis published to, to show that uh, acupuncture dry needling significantly more effective than sham or no treatment in short term for chronic low back pain, but not for acute low back pain. <clears throat> now, I, I just want to sort of uh, uh, look at OA of the knee as, a, as an example. Because uh, New England Journal 2002 published a very important study, uh, first paper in that issue, okay, showing that there's no difference between surgery for the knee, lavaging the knee, and also licking wounds around the knee joint. Okay? And, uh, and so there was a big editorial about the importance of the placebo response. So, 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 so basically, uh, you know, acupuncture close to the knee joint, but again, you can use you know, points elsewhere as well. Uh, it's probably uh, doing the same thing. And, he, and there's also archives in terms of publish a paper to massage the knee joint, the muscles around the knee joint, also have actually good response for oil knee. Kind of depends on, again, what level of significant you know, damage you know, of the knee joint, if it's bone against bone, you quite likely would need surgery. Uh, but then, uh, <clears throat> if it's early on, I think it's really important to <clears throat> figure out that uh, there may be other approaches that may be you know, uh, useful. <clears throat> but so I, and I really think that you know, for those of you who really are into research, go and <clears throat> learn more about the latest research the last 10 years about the, the placebo response. Because basically, wound healing Wound healing is basically the placebo response with any sort of, you know, surgery. But acupuncture may be looked upon as a microtrauma induced, you know, wound healing. So again, this is a uh, important, you know, study uh, <clears throat> published uh, like a few years ago that actually probably led to the explosion of people, you know, coming to our clinic for acupuncture treatment because uh, the uh, Individual patient data meta-analysis has demonstrated that acupuncture basically is more than a placebo. That means that, you know, besides the baseline 30%, you can go up to like 50, 60, 70%. Again, you know, acupuncture by itself is not, you know, useful. Just like any drug is not useful by itself, you may need other components as well. But, that, uh, but this is a, a study that was published first in the archives of internal medicine, and then then it was later on summarized, actually uh, represented, you know, uh, a little bit uh, in JAMA uh, that uh, talk, talk about acupuncture for chronic pain. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we, we think that acupuncture is just a way to stimulate. So I just want to use this other trial that we just published uh, last, last year. Uh, just by simply massaging <clears throat> the perineal muscle, right close, this is a local point, okay? We were able to demonstrate that, uh, that it's a four week intervention. These people just come into our, our research site. We have people to teach people how to do perineal massage of this acupressure point, you know, <clears throat> and uh, it has demonstrated significant improvement in constipation related quality of life, bowel function and health, and well-being among patients. <clears throat> and so, so again, you do not need to stick a needle. If people worry about a needle, you don't need to use a needle. You can use uh, TENS unit, you can, in other areas, uh, there's no needle penetration. <clears throat> so, 
in terms of pain, you know, obviously uh, we use the Tai Chi also. We published a paper actually in 2007 with Ryan. That's why I asked Ryan to write a book chapter with you on Tai Chi. He did this work with me as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, so basically, <clears throat> uh, Tai Chi is very, very useful. And I think later on, you know, Dr. You know, Helen Levesky is going to talk about Tai Chi for depression, but Tai Chi is very good for prevention of fall, uh, decrease, in, I mean, Dr. Michael Irwin may talk about, you know, I think he talked about sleep, but he probably talked about his work on improving, you know, uh, the immune system uh, function. <clears throat> but Tai Chi, also published in New England Journal by, you know, uh, Professor Wang at Tufts University, uh, how to use Tai Chi for fibromyalgia. And not the regular Tai Chi, but I think what she, you know, uh, uh, in her clinic, uh, have people who have trouble, you know, standing up. You know, she also teach people how to actually sit, uh, doing Tai Chi. <clears throat> so, what are the challenges doing research with Chinese medicine or integrated medicine in the in the sort of uh, uh, clinical setting? See, as you have heard early on in the lecture, I talk about that. You know, there is individualization. There's you know, multiple interventions. And then you have different diagnostic systems, the pattern versus the disease. Most people go by disease, but if you try to do it based on you know, uh, uh, pathophysiology, there are very few diseases. You know, cardiology actually is very physiological based. But there are many, many research in Western medicine are not based on pathophysiology. They may be based on chemical you know, uh, 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 differences, and we usually suppress stimulate, replace, okay. Changing treatment protocols as the patient's pattern evolves, okay? And that's why you, when you are in the ICU, when you put the swan GANs in, and you put all these data in, you know that you keep changing your treatment, okay? But oftentimes, you know, with many of our you know, studies, we fix it, okay? We try to fix all different variables, okay? So, so that's why I, I think that it's, it's uh, it's a, it's a, there's a need to think about sort of uh, what type of research approach that one needs to uh, employ. So different outcomes assessment. Uh, then you know, with many of the trials you know that we do in the CRC, you know, we talk about efficacy studies versus effectiveness studies. You know, what is actually happening in the real world. Uh, and then when you talk about translation, then you have about linguistic and cultural issues in translation of Chinese medicine. So right now, there's a lot of concern about biomedicalization of Chinese, you know, uh, illnesses and categories, and there are different sort of discrepancies. And we actually work on the idea about translation as well, because the majority of the last 60 years of modernization of Chinese medicine, the research done by these people, you know, uh, who like Hu Yao you know, uh, have not been translated. <clears throat> so the other thing is to the interpretation of the research. So most physicians are confused by the mixed result, okay? Uh, it, it kind of depends on where that data is published. Uh, is it published in integrated medicine specific journals, or is it in the mainstream you know, journal? Many readers do not understand the challenges of conducting research in this type of area. And then obviously patients are just confused. You know, uh, you know, they either get it through the internet or they get it through you know, uh, the news. Uh, and many physicians are largely biased by their own preferences by explaining research to patients. But also practitioners of Chinese in the West, there's a bias against conventional RCT-based research. Uh, because in general, not too many people are aware of the innovative forms of research that has been emerging the last 10, 15 years. So moving forward, what should we think about clinical translation science in you know, integrated medicine? I think that we need to expand our methodological repertoire such as, uh, so that we can participate in creating an appropriate evidence-based model of care that takes the whole person into consideration and address some of the serious health concerns facing contemporary society. Now, translation science is not just publishing research results. It also needs to take into consideration about dissemination, 
and how the medicine is applied in clinical practice, as well as how research results are interpreted by physicians, patients, and the public. Well, we wrote a paper <coughs> uh, about building evidence base for TCM and integrative medicine. And, uh, and I think uh, we'll go over this a little bit uh, and give some examples. Each of these approaches expands upon conventional approach to clinical research and can be combined with clinical trial data to yield a mixed methods approach. So obviously, patient-centered outcomes research uh, it's been, I don't know, six, seven years, uh, and it's still, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, slowly moving into, you know, uh, the realm of thinking of many of the researchers. Uh, but again, I, I wrote a paper with uh, Marion Katz uh, and also uh, <clears throat> Sonia Priska about the, the whole idea of patient-centered medicine, the difference between East and West and how we actually use both at the same time uh, in our clinical approach. Then, I think that over the years, uh, there has been comparative effectiveness research. The drug company has always been blocking over years comparing two different drugs, okay? Because it's easier to demonstrate is better than placebo. Uh, but once you compare the two, and if one is not as good, it will drop off from the formulary. So, uh, but, in clinical pharmacology, we have been pushing for competitive effectiveness research for like 20 some years. So the, the other approach is whole systems research. And that's what I talk about is that, you know, we, we, they come to our black box, they come to our clinic, and then it's a, it's a black box. They think about acupuncture just as, you know, one, it's one component, okay? But realistically, there are many things going on in that clin clinic that visit. So you have to think about the whole systems research approach. And again, health service research is also very important. It's been ongoing for like 40 some years. Before I decided to go to do clinical pharmacology fellowship and go with the biological route, I almost became a health service researcher. But I think that this is a very important field of research that now demonstrates a lot of problems. But we need to figure out how to do the research to, to show how you can solve problems. I think qualitative research is also very, very important. We uh, uh, clinical metrics. I mean, I, I still remember, you know, uh, the Yale, you know, uh, professor. Uh, his name just, uh, you know, uh, you know, escaped my slowly declining brain. <laughs> but you know, we lost a lot of data, you know, by not knowing the person, by not knowing more about the person. Uh, so, so you need to to look at qualitative research and combine quantitative and qualitative together, and then mixed methods research. So, so basically, uh, patient-centered outcomes research you know, uh, helps people and the caregivers communicate and make informed health decisions, uh, inclusive of the patient preferences, autonomy, needs. Those are outcomes that people notice and care about survival, function, symptoms, and, and health-related quality of life. Incorporates in a wide variety of settings and diversity uh, of participants to address individual differences and barrier to implementation and dissemination. Difficult, but very, very exciting, but still developing. And that, uh, uh, and I think that uh, uh, we, I think it's important for CAM research, and I'm glad that Helen, that you are working on a grant, you know, uh, for PICORI, right? PICORI, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think, sort of important to, to kind of look at uh, many of you know, the, the components of, uh, of the research uh, questions. So current studies pop, uh, supported by PICORI you know, in the area of uh, uh, acupuncture is acupuncture approaches to decrease disparities of, in outcomes of pain treatment a two-arm comparative effect effectiveness trial, optimizing patient engagement in a novel, novel pain management initiative, and then choosing options for insomnia in cancer effectively, a comparative effectiveness trial of acupuncture and positive behave, behavioral therapy.
So what are the advantages of you know, uh, competitive effectiveness research? I think uh, the advantage is that uh, it's easier to recruit people and retain people. Uh, it uh, allows us you know, to kind of look at individual responses and preferences rather than general outcomes and focusing on connecting research results to patient needs uh, and avoid challenges associated with developing appropriate control interventions because sometimes it's not easy to have a control and also uh, challenges with blinding and also uh, uh, people know that they are getting you know, good faith treatment. And uh, the challenges are listed, you know, uh, and I don't want to kind of you know, read through it, but you can uh, obviously, as you embark on this type of uh, research, you know, you know that uh, uh, it's uh, ev every new approach, and that's the reason why people are not doing it, is every new approach, you know, uh, can be quite messy and difficult and may, and may not be accepted by the, you know, the, 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 the journals, you know, that uh, may still, you know, have concerns about some of these approaches, because anything new, you know, some people uh, may not want to accept it, you know, uh, it takes at least two, three decades. And uh, <clears throat> so we, we think that, uh, and, uh, uh, Claudia Witt, in, uh, she used to be in Germany and now she's in Switzerland. Uh, she's a major researcher in Europe on looking at acupuncture. And, that, uh, and that's sort of uh, some of the things that she you know, really talk about uh, using trials that compare acupuncture plus conventional care to conventional care alone was closer to effectiveness than those that perform on a head-to-head -head comparison of acupuncture and conventional care. And I think this is sort of uh, what I think would be easier for people to accept. So whole systems research. Uh, Iris Bell in Arizona, I think, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, a major uh, thinker in uh, research in this area uh, look at uh, whole systems uh, because, I, and I believe that well-designed observational trials, which permit assessment of the patient in his or her full view world environment context, for us would be very, very important. And that uh, people need to know that RCT are only one tool among many uh, in the pragmatic, you know, whole systems research, including pragmatic trials factorial designs, preference trials, and N of one trials. Can I remember 20, what, one years ago, we already talked about this in terms of verbal research. But again, you know, it takes a lot longer time for things to uh, happen. So the challenge for, you know, whole systems research is uh, need to identify appropriate valid outcomes, reduce ability to control the effects of non-specific components of the treatment, and methodological cha challenges such as inter-rater uh, reliability for diagnosis, different treatment styles, and also complex statistics often required. So a study was published uh, in 2008 on whole system clinical trial of translational Chinese medicine, the traditional Chinese medicine and natural medicine for treatment of TM, TMD. And, uh, <clears throat> It's, uh, it's, it's a small study, and that, uh, uh, that there, there's, there's a positive you know, uh, results. But again, as we mentioned earlier, we need to look at inter-rater reliability for TCM diagnosis, as well as determining best outcome measures. So, God, you know, this is a study that we did uh, kind of a whole, close to a whole systems research. Because see, people come to us, it's not just getting acupuncture. They are also getting educated about acupressure at home, how to handle stress, how to eat, how to, you know, to deal with uh, cancer-related fatigue. Some of these patients have pain as well. And uh, God, when we first try to get uh, uh, IRB approval, God, they, they fought us all the way for a year before they allow us to do this trial. And we just say, okay, we just say patient education. and. Uh, uh, but, uh, but basically, uh, it's, it's closer to what is actually happening clinically by adding education 
uh, wood, you know, uh, acupuncture, and that uh, uh, we uh, demonstrate that you know it's it's very very useful. And then subsequently, a trial was done to show that uh, acupuncture was very useful for cancer related fatigue. And uh, and then I wrote an editorial you know about that that, that uh, multi center trial. Well, health service research. I mentioned earlier about you know. Uh, why this is important, and that uh, I, I was very, very interested uh, this past Saturday, listening to uh, Dr. Holmes' uh, sort of uh, uh, work on the value-based uh, uh, research, you know, uh, and how he applied to uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and you know, looking at uh, a different components from biologic biomarkers to disease activity, to educating the patients, uh, and to including wellness in the uh, uh, component, uh, it's really so. So it's, I think you know the reason why there's a movement towards uh, a lot of these type of research is because uh, now as we move you know, uh, to an out to an ACO, and when the income is uh, less. And the expenditure for managing a particular disease, uh, we need to figure out how to incorporate some of the approaches that may be as effective and maybe safer. When you save her, you save money. And uh, I think the key thing right now is that in you know, this type of research is going to be much much more important after 40 some years. Uh, is because I think uh, the time is for uh, you know. Clinical care delivery, uh, you know, with pain, even pain. I mean, right now, there's so many patients that we see. We have we have a, a component to take care of people who cannot get out of the hospital when they have pain or nausea and vomiting. They keep going in and out, in and out, and you know that every 30 days you go in, you have to pay a penalty. So, so I think that uh, health service research, you know, is going to be uh, very very important. And uh, and these are some examples of. Uh, Approaching, I mean, using this approach, uh, but again, not not a whole lot, not enough. And we did a study with uh, Ron Hayes, uh, looking at statistical significance of you know, health related quality of life change in individual patients, and looking at you know uh, changes in in this for 40, 54 patients uh, through our clinic. This is this is a study you, you know it published in. Uh, you can read more you know, closer to an evaluation of health uh, profession. So I talk about qualitative research because I, I, I really think that most people, most patients basically uh, have a story to tell. And I think in general, a lot of things uh, uh, have impact on uh, people's thinking because the, you know, people share the stories. And I think that this is a part that I think will be becoming important uh, as uh, we we bring the person back into you know uh, the research arena, and that uh, so <clears throat> so I think uh, <clears throat> and that uh, and we also sort of uh, published you know Priska obviously she left recently uh, to become a new job elsewhere, and the mixed methods basically combining the quantitative with the qualitative. Uh, Research, and that uh, uh, I think it would be important to uh, to include this uh, in some of the newer uh, approach of research. Okay, so just a few words about dissemination, and I, I think that you know right now, obviously, the Picori's idea is that we'll bring some of this information to the community, and uh, we need to figure out how to educate. Uh, the physicians and how to educate the, the patients, and uh, obviously, for the, the literature from uh, in Chinese medicine, a lot of a lot of good research. Uh, is that there are very little research done by the Chinese medicine practitioner community here. There's increasing number of them team up with you know places like Harvard or Johns Hopkins or whatever you know to do you know or UCLA to do some of these type of research, but but the majority of research done in China remain untranslated, and that uh, uh, so there has 
uh, to uh, needs to be done. And then at the same time, we have to figure out how to use the right language to educate patients too. So that's why when I try to translate Toyoyo's work for the Western world, it's very, very difficult because uh, uh, it's not just science, it's, it's, it's medicine. Now, hers is actually not as difficult because hers is still Western medicine, uh, as far as I'm concerned, finding a new drug from the herbal pharmacopoeia. But to try to sort of uh, describe Chinese medicine in, its, in English with the, the language of Chinese medicine, the, you know, the, the signs uh, 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 of, of uh, Chinese medicine, and then try to let the Western world at the highest level to understand what this is all about is very, very difficult. And I'm probably one of the few people with the, the five, six domain of knowledge to attempt to try to do it. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's why over the years, one of the reasons why we are so successful clinically, you know, uh, I, I, I can see that you know, this model would go to 100 clinics, 1,000 clinics, I mean, as I'm concerned, okay? And over years, because we have trained, like for 21 years, uh, many UCLA med students, you know, we have done 20 years for fourth year students, we have rotations for residents since 1999. We have fellowships since 1999. And, uh, and now I think that you know, one of my latest work is to actually go back to convince China that Chinese medicine is very important. You better train your Western trained practitioners and also public health people to learn Chinese medicine. So one of my latest work is to train 12,000, 12,000 all community, well, you know, I'm not a PI, my, but I propose it. Shanghai the government, you know, uh, basically uh, have a contract with my counterpart at Fudan, who is, you know, the president of the Shanghai branch of integrated medicine. There's 70,000 people in China doing integrated medicine, the members. There's six to 7,000 in Shanghai alone. So, so they basically now have a course over six months to teach all their Western trained physicians and public health people you know, to learn Chinese medicine. So I, I'm their, you know, advisor, and, uh, and we have a consultant for how we are doing it in the United States, and why, you know, uh, I, I think that in China, their model is still more disease-based, and teaching TCM in, in, you know, the usual way. We base, I think that what we have is, that I already digest what I think is important about Chinese medicine. I know that what is useful, important about the latest thinking about the frontiers in Western medicine. I put the two together, and that's really the model that you know I think would be uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, be, you know I can explain it a little bit better because I have not been able to let people know that we are not just an acupuncture clinic. Okay, we have created over the last twenty some years in my clinical laboratory in the clinic a model. That has now been accepted by UCLA. is financially viable, clinically sometimes successful, and that uh, and that we we basically you know now trying to figure out how to uh, globalize it. And uh, so it, it's sort of a uh, we can expand the clinic. We can think about doing some more research. But right now my work is to think about how to find innovative ways. So so because of the twelve thousand people that we train, I have used. Uh, the video format. So I'm also writing a book right now to, 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 to try to let people not not the, the book you know on it on integrated medicine is you know what are some of the, the things that Western physicians or scientists need to know about how you can benefit from knowing a little bit about Chinese medicine and how we actually you know incorporate it in our clinical approach. So I think with that I'm going to conclude because I, I want uh, you know, time for a break before you would listen to my very good friend, Dr. Lonnie, Professor Lonnie Salsa, world-renowned expert in pain, particularly applied to, you know, pediatrics. And um, so it's a 47-year journey for me. I'm just summarizing in an hour and 20 minutes. Wow. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you so much for coming and giving this uh, comprehensive talk, uh, but also your journey. Uh, I mean, you serve as an example of what it takes to push this new innovative methods of healing uh, into the mainstream. Uh, any questions for Dr. Gu? I just want to comment, having 
been around, I think, as long as you, and, and knowing sort of how UCLA, the academic institution, initially thought about TCM and what you were setting up, and then the just amazing transformation because of your perseverance and, and productivity that has come about during this time. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's really quite amazing. Well, I, I really think that, uh, you know, it, it, it's basically, that's why I said you're crazy, you know, because it, it's a dream. It's a dream come true. And I think that Dr. Melancholy is my inspiration. He built UCLA by over 20 some years to make research to be well renowned. He brought from Johns Hopkins the Western model of medicine to LA. And, and I basically have learned so much, not just from, you know, obviously from him, from Bill Valentine, and, you know, Schwabi, and many people throughout my last 47 years, and obviously, you know, Alan Fogel, who's a strategist, you know, in, in helping to build this health system. But, but, but I think that I think the key thing is to really just looking at what, why are we going to medicine? Going to medicine is to help the mixed person, okay? Help the mixed patient, but also now I'm, I'm more, actually the last 10, you know, 15 years is more public health. How can we help the population? So that's what I'm sort of uh, trying to, uh, to do, but, but the, this is a tribute to my mentor for 40. Mm -hmm. Actually, I get to meet him in 1973, two or three, so it's like, Wow. 40 some years, so yeah. lucky <laughs> for me. And, and uh, so the 12,000 people are Chinese physicians or all of Yeah, Shanghai, people? just from Shanghai. Oh, wow. The entire okay. Shanghai, you know, health system uh -huh. community. Because see, I, I believe that uh, in general, uh, CAM, it is, to me, it's not just in physicians. My belief about climate case, get the information of what we are doing to the woman at home, uh -huh. the, the, the mother, the wife and the daughter. I, I really think that you know uh, uh, to take it to the ivory tower. The, through the women, the, the <laughs> deciders. <laughs> no, you, you guys are the health. Yeah, you health. are the health coach, the coordinator, right? Mm -hmm. And you are you are always systems thinkers. Okay. I, I hear it from uh, primary care providers that you need to. They just don't talk to men. They turn to. Women. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, so Great. anyway, okay, so we get ready so for, the, for the next talk. Yeah. Uh, we introduced ourselves. Wh whoever didn't introduce ourselves, yeah, maybe. Who are you? I'm Jonathan Eskenazi. I'm a neurology resident at Sears. Oh, okay. Are you interested in CAM or? Uh, yeah. but I, I wanted. By this I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to learn. I'm, I'm here doing pathology, so I said I'll take uh, the morning. Okay. Okay. Welcome. And oh, <laughs> thank you for introducing me. <laughs> I'm Emily Che. I'm one of the NURSA fellows um, at GIM, and I also do geriatrics. Uh -huh. So I've actually seen, you've seen some of my patients. So yeah. thank you for that. Okay, great. Can everybody go around since it's oh, not a large group, yeah, but I missed yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 yeah. intros. Right. Right. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, once, oh, once again, okay. I'm uh, a Grisel, you can call my Chinese name Jean. I come from China. I'm a visiting doctor and a professor at Center for East and Western Medicine. Uh, <laughs> I'm Hua Zhang, come, come from Shanghai, Host, Shuguan Hospital. I'm a visiting scholar also. Yeah, she is actually doing a lot of research on, on how to reverse fibrosis in, in, in liver disease. Uh, so. Cool. Hmm. She arrived uh, on Sunday. Oh. <laughs> and she's going to take over. She's, she's, they're finding their way in Los Angeles. <laughs> right, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. And, you, and you made it here. You made it here. <laughs> <laughs> this yes. is the worst building ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got lost this morning. But she has a PhD. She's a PhD. She's a nurse, a sports master degree in uh, sport, uh, sports science, science, and then a PhD in physiology. She translated. <clears throat> You know, Ventus uh, uh, book in physiology is Chinese, <laughs> and she got a PhD in Chinese medicine. So wow. I bumped into her in May in Korea in the in, in international meeting. I said, well, "Why don't you come?" <laughs> so that's. Uh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Monika Rebicka, and I come from Poland, Krakow. I have finished my medical school last year, 
uh, and I'm an internal medicine resident. I, I start in January, in February. And uh, I, did a two year, uh, I did a scholarship at the UCLA two years ago, and then I met Dr. Huey, and he inspired me to learn more about integrative esports medicine. And now I'm, I'm back for three and a half weeks to learn more. Yeah, I'm Jane <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my name is Robbie, and I'm a research associate working with Dr. Delter. Okay, very yes. good. Thank you for the informative lecture. And so, do you have. Um, um, just just to tell you the story of how we organized this course, um, I was talking to the CTSI uh, about it, and when I first came to introduce the idea, they said, who would be in jail? <laughs> like, why would you do something like this? And, and historically, like, I, I, was, I, I was working with them giving psychopharmacology lectures, you know, or pharmacology, geriatric uh, pharmacology lectures. And uh, I developed this in, interest in integrative medicine, and I said it's so widespread, especially in Los Angeles. Everybody, every patient uh, we see on the West Side uses some modality. And physicians generally are not trained to understand them and uh, basically are not aware of health effects of integrative approaches, uh, alternative approaches. And uh, so it took a little bit of a con convincing, but the main argument that worked was that younger generations are a lot more open to uh, using complementary and alternative medicine approaches. It's no longer boxed away as alternative. Uh, it's in in their mind because they do yoga, they do meditation. They they know Tai Chi. It's all over Los Angeles. It's no longer something out there. And uh, it would be very helpful for younger physicians and trainees to understand at least basics of it and how to do um, uh, translational research with it. She's coming back. Don't worry. I'll be, I'll be back. Um, okay. 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 So, and we have quite a few stellar faculty here at UCLA who do really pioneering research like Kakit, one of the few first ones who developed this. Loni is a pioneer in pediatric pain. She does wonders with, uh, with uh, little children um, using all sorts of approaches. I'm actually a certified yoga teacher. So I study yoga and Tai Chi. Uh, and I met Loni at the strange uh, conference uh, to yoga therapists in the Kripalu Center once, <laughs> where she gave a talk on the use of yoga and meditation for healing in, in children. So that's sort of like groundbreaking for me. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, compared with uh, Tai Chi and yoga, do you think? Uh, um, uh, do they have uh, simultaneously uh, parts? And the second is, uh, do you think which one has different the difference? Are there the differences and, and uh, similarities? Uh, yeah. There are differences and similarities, but you know, yoga is in India, you know, and Tai Chi is in, and uh, is that the culture. Buddhism. I think it's uh, there. There are there are a lot of similarities uh, in terms of holistic approaches, and rather take rather than taking. Uh, a single organ approach like your heart, your yeah. lungs, your, it's a whole system approach. Also, uh, chi, you know, uh -huh. that is the basis for, for the development of acupuncture and Tai Chi practices, uh -huh. um, has an equivalent in Indian culture as Kundalini energy in the spine, so it's a uh, rebalancing of the energy of the flow. Uh, so they, they use different words, but they uh, have some very similar concepts of what constitutes well-being and how you rebalance oneself and how you engage uh, body's ability to heal, heal themselves. So the principles, they may use different words, but they uh, hit the same the concept. concepts. Yeah, mm -hmm. use the same concepts. Ayurvedic medicine is very much uh, similar to Chinese uh, uh, inclusion of uh, diet and lifestyle uh, yeah. principles. And 
having this three elements, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't know much about it, but uh, I, I really interested in it. Yeah, for some basic uh, concept, uh, I think it's they, they, that's mm -hmm. they, they, they use food as medicine very actively. Uh, yoga and meditation use a lot of what Tai Chi is known for, um, uh, re rebalancing principles of, of the body. It's also more individualized than uh, Western medicine. It's very difficult. Like he was saying, uh, Chinese herbs are being researched one by one, but it's really a complex of Chinese herbs. You right. know, I utilize a lot of. Uh, Chinese medicine myself. I, I'm a user. I have an acupuncturist who uses all sorts of, you know. And I know that at UCLA, because of the more of a concern of uh, Western medicine approaches, they don't use in the clinic. They don't use herbal as, uh, at all. Yeah. And they, I don't think they use combustion at all. Maxuba, maxuba, what is it? The word combustion is the burn, burning. Yeah. Maxi Bastion. Maxi Bastion. Yeah. yeah Maxi Bastion. Um, and uh, so, so, and that's why I had to go outside of your cell to kind of <laughs> use that. <laughs> but I like Maxi Bastion. I love, I uh, know, but also cupping. They don't use cupping uh, in the clinic. Some, uh, sometimes they use cupping, but uh, yeah, for the safety. I love cupping. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, I, I, you can't you can't get the full. Um, you know, exposure to Chinese medicine at your cell, unfortunately. <laughs> so I had to go and find somebody who was trained in China and um, just practice it here. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Besides uh, Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, do you interested in other traditional medicine? Uh, I just judge from your uh, good practice. Are you interested in Chinese medicine? I'm interested in all types of medicine. Oh, and yeah. I use myself as a subject. You know, I experience everything and then I write about it. <laughs> That's yeah, that's yeah, yeah. So, so, but it's fascinating, you know, to me just to experience. My book just came out, and I wish I, I, I had another book, Integrated Medicine for Mental Health and Aging, like beautiful international textbook of uh, different healing modalities. We have chiropractic care, manual therapies, uh, herbal therapies, um, all sorts. You know, we have 33 chapters of different things one might do. You know, to help themselves heal, uh, especially for seniors, for aging. Uh, for aging yeah, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, data don't exist necessarily in aging, but we applied it to the disorders of aging, like pain or cancer, or, you know, uh, chronic um, arthritis. So we have chapters on disease categories where it's applied. Okay, so we could start with Ronnie's talk. Okay, thank you for being well, here. I'm Dr. Huey went first because I think he gave really a, a, framework. Good, a, framework. a great framework. And what I'd like to do is have it be much more interactive. interactive. Um, I uh, also want to thank Robbie for helping me with the slide because I'm right handed. Oh, and so yeah. doing that, trying to make slides is yeah. very difficult. Um, so I was asked by Helen to talk about integrative medicine and integrative health and the, uh, with a focus on pain and cancer, both children and adults. I'm a pediatrician. I work mostly with children and adolescents, maybe young adults, so I don't have the broader adult geriatric, um, <laughs> although geriatrics and pediatric. But, um, as you get older, you become pediatric-like. Right, exactly. <laughs> you have an Jules Pfeiffer cartoon. <laughs> um, so I, I thought what I would do is talk about what pain is, uh, just to give sort of a current neuroscience <coughs> framework, um, and then talk about sort of the transition from NCAM to uh, NCCIH, and I'll talk about sort of the, the model for thinking. Um, then I, I will talk about types of pain and cancer, and then the focus of some of the studies, and there's a very good review article looking at a meta-analysis of integrative medicine, where pain is the only outcome versus 
symptoms that seem to cluster together and uh, how our outcomes may be different depending upon, I mean, findings may be different depending upon what the outcomes are. Um, and then, you know, we just did a review of the literature on complementary integrative therapies with a focus on pain in cancer, children, I have research in them and I know that literature. Adults, I have go to the literature. Felt like I was back in high school doing a book report, <laughs> but reviewing the literature on adults. And then um, just talk about some of the issue uh, sources of bias in, when you review research in complementary integrative medicine in general. And it really it, it adds to what Dr. Huey talked about in terms of some of the complexities in doing research in integrative medicine. So, um, so the old model was a very binary um, model. You know, you had a yield the cart model. You had an injury, and on the top, and the pain signaling went from your toe up the, the sensory nerves to your brain and and um, we know that there are all kinds of individual differences in the pain experience based on differences in neurobiology and context on you know what state you're in at the moment I mean a lot of things and so we know that it's really a it's a, a bi-directional model that we have this pain transmission system that's generally upward and this pain inhibitory system that's generally um, downward in terms of reducing or, or altering pain. But, uh, and there are a lot of things that can influence that. And with modern imaging, we actually know a whole, whole lot more about what we call the central pain matrix. And we know in terms of, uh, you know, initially when this research got started, it was looking at location. Okay, anterior cingulate was important, prefrontal cortex, somatosensory one, two, thalamus as the relay station, periaqueductal gray, um, had a lot of uh, inhibitory, um, antinociceptive substances, etc. And so everybody got excited about location. I think with the advent of a resting state functional MRI, we know that there's a lot more than location, but it's connectivity and strength of connectivity. And so you have connectivity in in the 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 pain in and again, I'm being very simplistic, but the, in the pain signaling areas uh, in posterior part of anterior cingulate, the somatosensory one and two, if you look at the red connectivity lines, that's sort of your pain processing experiential, you know, if you ask somebody to rate pain on a, how intense is it on a zero to 10 scale, you know, for them to process, oh, it's a, it's a 10, those areas are active. How much does it bother you? Well, that's more in the anterior cingulate. But we know that there's a lot of connectivity from the prefrontal cortex, which is really your, one of your primary pain inhibitory um, sort of executive function coordination centers. And for example, we know how a lot of um, psychological interventions like mindfulness, like um, cognitive behavioral therapy, actually enhance the connectivity of the prefrontal cortex to this um, central pain matrix and alter the experience of the pain and, and its bothers, the suffering component. Um, and, uh, What's important to know is that while there are these general areas, these areas are richly, there's a lot of connectivity in cortical areas. So how do, 
how does cognition, how does appraisal, how does all of that influence the experience of pain? There's connectivity to the amygdala, and so fear center, and what happens with fear, what happens with um, in the limbic center, habit center, how do emotions influence the experience of pain? So we begin to see that it's a very rich, complex system of interconnectivity. And so we can see how early life experience, you know, not just the neurobiology that you're born with, but what happens at birth. What is your early life experience? How many, you know, significant pain episodes, traumatic episodes have you had? How does that influence this architecture and connectivity pattern and your environment? And so we move to sort of a, the more holistic model, you know, if we look at traditional Chinese medicine, or, that we're really talking about a complex system and it's not a union variable system. Um, so when we think about integrative medicine, um, we're, we're thinking about how do we pull in all of these complexities of what we think about as stress and, and sort of the physiologic stress process. And stress over time, how does that wear down reserves? And then where, you know, how does that impact um, wellness or, or recovery? And, so we, you know, surgery, medications, and it's a very complex system. So you can see if you just look at the big circle and pieces on the right, try to design a study accounting for all of those things and have it be well controlled in the old traditional biomedical research model. Well, it's obviously very different unless you have millions of subjects and you know, power is good. 5,000 groups, comparison groups. Um, well, actually, not necessarily true. Even with uh, 40,000 patients, four, actually, four groups, I did the all head trial. Yeah. 40,000 patients, $290 million, four drug groups. And at the end, the data showed that directly is very different from the other, you know, uh, from ACE inhibitor or calcium blocker. Still, at the end, after all these papers, Doctors still use, you know, oh, other yeah. drugs. Oh, changing, so, so, so changing behavior. Changing behavior is a whole nother level, and that's sort of in where, you know, and, and also consumer beliefs and, and what consumers will do regardless of data, scientific data. So practices, cultural differences, biases. So there's, um, you know, it's, it's complex, but you sort of have to accept a certain amount of complexity and develop sort of the study based on what you hope to gain from the study. It's a little different models for that. Um, and typically one defines integrative medicine as use of evidence-based complementary practices in conjunction with evidence-based conventional care and recognizing that Conventional care isn't always uh, evidence-based, and neither is various complementary therapies that are used, even though that's sort of the ideal model. Well, I mean, the drug company obviously talk about, well, we have all this data, but they have millions and billions of dollars to do research, so right. LCT-based, right? And, and but, they also suppress quite a bit of it. <laughs> oh, the ones that come out. In yeah. Anyway. And I, I love, I love, you know, everybody wants a control and a placebo control. And I love Ted Kapchuk's, uh, Ted Ted Kapchuk's article where people responded to placebo even though they knew they were told it was a placebo. So there's something about sort of belief system and expectation. And, and so when we think about a nice randomized control where you have a good placebo, what does that mean? What's the expectation about the placebo? Um, you know, expectation of that outcome from the study, that all of these things can influence outcome. And that's why if you look at placebo-controlled drug trials, the variance, I mean, in, across, in, in uh, differential effect across studies, 
can range from 10% to 90%. Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of my placebo response. 80%. Me as a placebo. 80%. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> because a lot of it is a relationship exactly. with the care provider and the place they're like, if they come to UCLA to participate, it's a big thing that, you know. Right. I'm saying so, you know, and, and um, so actually, who does the research <laughs> and the contact with the subjects has a significant I'm impact totally. on the outcome. And that doesn't mean that one. You know, you have 90% response in your placebo group and 100% response in your, so there's a 10% difference. Well, statistically, that's not significant, but it means that both were effective. So, so just on the placebo yeah. issue, in psychiatry, we struggle a lot with high placebo effects. They are almost as high as drug effects, and that's why it's very hard to find the certain drug placebo differences. And at some point, the research community was struggling with how to administer this placebo arm, and uh, they would vacillate from hiring uh, non-expressive research coordinators who have like no facial expression <laughs> to robotic, uh, to centralized assessment where there's no relationship, no connection. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the reality is there's going to be individual differences in responses to either. I mean, do you have a robot as your <laughs> control provider yeah. and doing things in an automatic way? And there are going to be people that really feel good like about that, that <laughs> like that, and they're going to be huge responders. And that's the whole idea of who should get what, because they're, you know, trying in research, trying to identify what are the characteristics of the individual in what situation that will benefit most from what kind of plan, you know, integrative plan. And, you know, so it, it um, as we say, uh, medicine broadly, health is more art than science. Um, oh, and then the other thing is, regardless of the scientific evidence, almost half of people diagnosed with cancer use some form of integrative medicine whether they tell their oncologist or not. Mm -hmm. And there are some uh, botanicals, in fact, that interact with some of the chemotherapy drugs that can reduce um, blood levels, you know, increase metabolism or, or, uh, or decrease metabolism of some therapy drugs. Obviously, the idea of trying to encourage patients to communicate, but then help oncologists learn more about integrative medicine. So if somebody says they're using turmeric, um, that the oncologist will at least have the, the guts to go look up what does turmeric do and what are the interactions and or seek out somebody who really understands that. And and again that's the you know it takes a whole community to help one individual. Um, so in, um, actually in recognition, it only took, I don't know, when, when was well, NCAM? NCAM started with the Office of Alternative Medicine since 1992. There was a uh, uh, $2 million, so they started the office right. in NIH, okay? okay? And it was, it was just a homeopathic yeah, dose. Right. So then, then, then <laughs> it's it really, I mean, it's only until 1998, 1999, then it become NCAM. Mm -hmm. so, and then it become like close to a hundred million dollars of research money. Right. So how long did it take? It's in February 2015, so a little less than a year ago, um, NCAM changed its name to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health with the idea that the model is really, first of all, that there's prevention, there's wellness, it's not just medicine, and there are a lot of um, therapeutic and, um, processes involved in uh, adding complementary and, um, uh, and integrative, I mean, this whole concept of integrative health. And I don't even like to use the word integrative medicine because that still sticks with, in my mind, the biomedical model. So it's, it's um, mm -hmm. you know, what do we mean by um, and then they 
it, what's interesting is that in a lot of the literature and in the NIH notice, alternative medicine from the NK domain was dropped, it said, for lack of evidence. And I think the idea is not that, as, as Kit talked about, TCM can be layered in with Western medicine so that you have a broader, you know, I love the trees and forests. Yeah, you know, I like that too. That, right. that really was beautiful. Yeah. So, but the idea is it's not an either or, it's really integrative. Um, and so they, they defined integrative healthcare as comprehensive, often interdisciplinary approach to treatment, prevention, and health promotion that brings together the complementary. Um, any comments before we So I'm, I'm gonna, since I was asked to talk about cancer, I, um, I thought I would give a little, a brief tutorial on types of cancer pain. How many of you have had experience with somebody in your family or a friend or clinically uh, took care of somebody who had cancer? So, um, and obviously there are some similarities in types of cancer pain in, a, in adults with cancer and in children with cancer and even across the developmental trajectory in childhood cancer, for example, um, bone and soft tissue sarcomas, like osteogenic sarcoma wounds, are more common in adolescents and young adults those have different kinds of pain and morbidity than acute lymphoblastic leukemia in young children, which has about a 90% cure rate. So they're all with different morbidity, different patterns. That doesn't mean that there's not a lot of stress involved. But, um, and, and for children, they're more likely to have medical procedure pain as the biggest sort of pain problem in childhood cancer because the, a lot of the protocols, I mean, they're needing bone marrow aspirations and biopsies repeatedly, uh, needing uh, lumbar punctures, maybe intrathecal medication. So it's in, in regular intervals over time in the, the, the common young childhood cancer populations. And you'll see when we look at the research in pediatric oncology, most of the research focused on pain is around medical and integrative health is in medical procedure. So we'll, we'll go over that. So in general, if you think of types of pain, pain based on the experience of the individual, and again, this is generalities, recognizing there's huge individual differences. So we think of neuropathic pain as pain that is described by the individual, and again, a lot of this came out of qualitative studies and mixed method studies, um, and often described as burning, shooting pain, stabbing pain, electrical pain, uh, or allodynia, where you have really central pain activation so that there's spreading in areas that normally wouldn't be experienced as painful touching the skin. Um, certainly in, not in cancer pain, but you have complex regional pain syndrome, which is sort of a, a classic central pain, um, neuropathic type pain where there's allodynia in the skin. But also from the cancer perspective, you can have tumor growing into or compressing uh, nerve roots and Nerve, uh, so you'll have a radiculopathy. Uh, phantom pain is probably a classic one in the sense that um, having pain in an extremity or body part that's not even there anymore. And that's because we have that neural circuitry for that sensory input, positional input, et cetera, for that body part. And even though you remove the body part, that circuitry is still there, that connectivity. And there's uh, data to show that 
people with a developed phantom limb pain uh, are more likely to have experienced pain prior to the amputation uh, because we have deactivated that central pain circuit. Um, even though you remove the limb, you still have that central pain circuit. And despite the data, because often oncologists look at oncology data, pain research look at pain research data, so people looking at studying at phantom limb pain may not connect with oncologists who are treating people who have who need amputations, for example, for tumor growth. And so a very common, and I'm surprised to learn this, um, when somebody has a limb salvage procedure, which is it, that there was a transition from if you had a bone tumor in your leg, instead of removing the limb above where the tumor site is, they would, especially in kids, they would do limb salvage, so they would try to get the part that was healthy below and the part that was healthy above, remove the malignant part and replace it with a rod, which then obviously as children grew would have to be replaced. And there was a large, and they thought that that would be, then kids would have their extremity, they would walk around with one extremity, it would be bilateral, <clears throat> of course, then they had to learn how to use that extremity, and um, and a lot of these kids, not a lot, some of these kids would have the, um, extreme pain in the leg that had the limb salvage, and so the treatment was in oncology. Well, we'll just amputate. Of course, that didn't solve the problem because of the developed phantom limb pain, even though they didn't have the limb anymore. But again, it's even though the research was there on phantom limb back the, you know, um, Melzac, Ron Melzac in Canada actually did one of the first studies documenting that if you have pain before you have an amputation, you're much more likely to get phantom limb pain. And so, but of course, the and the idea of the importance of team science and disciplinary work to do. Um, typically, nociceptive pain is experienced as pressure, um, aching, throbbing. Kids will say it just hurts. Mm -hmm. um, and pain with palpation of the affected area. So, um, and that can be uh, so. You know, sticking needles in to do biopsies, for example, procedural pain, inflammatory pain. Um, so you have a bone marrow transplant, there's about a seven to 10 day period where you have mucositis, so you have an inflammatory response in the mucous membranes, that's inflammatory, there's sloughing, there's pain. Um, pancreatitis is another example. Um, and then myofascial pain is probably one of the most common in cancer and not in cancer, one of the most common kinds of pain because um, when we talk about myofascial, we're talking about um, muscle pain in general and muscle strain, muscle spasm, um, tenderness at ligament insertions to muscles, I mean to bones at the end of the muscles. And Certainly, that's where Dr. Huey's clinic, you know, the idea of, um, as you said, trigger points, where you find trigger points and maybe acupuncture points are not that far off in some cases. Um, but the idea that you do an exam and the muscles are hard, they're tender, um, feels cramping, um, get pain with the range of motion, um, if you press on the muscle, often there are tender points. And we're also learning that um, sort of Western diagnoses are changing So with modern uh, imaging. And so it used to be to diagnose fibromyalgia, for example, you, at least in adults, you had to have, what is it, 18 
trigger points, you know, count them. You know, <coughs> I mean, it was very formulaic. And, and still, you didn't believe it existed. Huh? And still, nobody oh, and believed that. Believe that it existed. No, I think the uh, neurologists uh, do not has not accepted it. Uh, rheumatologists, rheumatologists, right, rheumatologists. Yeah, rheumatologists. Yeah. rheumatologists. I think general medicine has. I think that the neurology has not accepted the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. <laughs> Well, I think they are intertwined. They're intertwined because by the time that's why you know some motor is useful because if by the time you have chronic pain, you have depression. You have well, that's that's yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about that exactly. And you know, and so um, and in children, when do you make a diagnosis, an adult diagnosis in a child? So is juvenile fibromyalgia the same as adult fibromyalgia? Well, if you follow kids. The pathways are different, but families look at the, they go online and they see all the, the websites on fibromyalgia, and this is lifelong, and this, you know, because of also who, who are on getting support on some of these public um, uh, websites and listservs. And so they already are having expectations of lifelong morbidity in their child. So, um, and so now we know that, for example, um, really what we're talking about is sort of a recruitment and activation of central neural point systems with one spread, with or without X number of finger points, because it's a central pain processing problem that relates to connectivity. And when you have increased connectivity in the pain matrix, there are also, as I mentioned, slowly over time, increasing connectivity to other areas of the brain and developing depression, anxiety, sleep problems, fatigue. You see the spreading of symptoms, especially the longer. Oh, and I, I will say one of my pet peeves, um, I'm not supposed to talk about cancer, but um, there are, I see tons of kids, especially adolescents, that have chronic pain in their legs, that have been treated by neurologists um, repeatedly going to multiple neurologists as chronic migraine with all of the migraine meds. They end up, either the adolescents will go to marijuana for the street or they'll Opioids because nobody else knows what to do. And if you do a careful exam, you know, what you find is that the headaches are myofascial headaches, the trigger points in various areas. If they're grinding their teeth at night because they're stressed, they get um, you know, masseter muscles that are tender and known fight flight, but also finding ways to deal with the stress. And, um, and also, they're not getting sleep. So, you know, it becomes a cascade, which then gets to the whole person. And that, and unless you take a good history of all of that, and that's why our initial evaluations are two hours, because I can't imagine doing it unless you have know, developmental history, and birth history, and family history, and then, and, and you well, know, how about our Jew, Richard, who's 90 years old? We would take the history all the way to yeah. 90 years of age yeah. with so many different diseases and episodes of surgery and I multiple merger of all these uh, three types of pains together. That's <laughs> why you're with pediatrics. But, <laughs> but, the, but you, know, you also have the, the parent observations and history if they come in a mother and father, you have the mother's history and the father or the other partners, you have the parent's history, you have the child's history. You have where there's congruence and discord, and then you know, and it, it um, and of course, I a lot of the families I call onion families because you know, you sort of you peel away one layer and you realize, whoa, there's a whole other layer you didn't know about. So then the next time you see them, you take that layer off, and it's whoo, there's even more layer, and and it's just a, an unpeeling of yeah. new information. That affects, you know, the, the 
again the whole child. And the other the other thing I just want to talk about is um, if you're in UCLA in a Western medical clinic, so unlike the I think is my impression somebody going to the East West Center expects integrative care, expects traditional Chinese medicine added to whatever medical care they're already getting, putting it all together. When they come to the pediatric pain clinic at UCLA, the expectation is even if their child has been bedridden for three years and they've seen 42 different specialists and gotten a gazillion dollars, which start Treatment. working tomorrow. They should come in, leave with a single diagnosis, a single pill to treat that diagnosis, and dance out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and obviously, that doesn't happen. Well, yeah. usually, my, my first of all, I said we do not have an acupuncture clinic. We I, we have a problem solving clinic, and if you tell me how many years you have this problem, and I will tell you that well, how many weeks months it would take you. Usually my rule of thumb is that if you have 20 years of pain, then you give me 12, month, uh, 12 months to hopefully get you back to hopefully no pain. But it would take me 12 weeks for you to start you know, feeling. feeling something. Because see, otherwise, they think that you're a magician, right? So and in fact, there isn't any. So I think prognostically, it's very important for that people to, to understand that. Uh, it, and then you have to explain to them that I'm rebuilding your infrastructure. You have infrastructure breakdown that lead to all these fires, okay? Pain is only, I keep telling you, the pain is only one of the things that brings you in. But I am going to work on your breakdown infrastructure, okay? Basically, if you look at them, they have pain, they have fatigue, they have sleep problems, as you said, but then they also have their hypertension, their diabetes, and, and so on, and their uh, you know, connective tissue disease. I said, I need to re-regulate each one of your systems, okay? So now how often do you prescribe your how often in the week? Let's say, is it once a week? Once we try to. Right now, we are so busy yeah, that we go to once a so week, you know, every two weeks, every three weeks. So that's why I use the TENS unit. I also teach uh -huh. people to so. do it you know, at home if you can do acupressure or and do all the other things. But realistically, you cannot, you, we cannot see them you know, more than once a week or you know, two, twice a month. But in children, like you said, it's an onion problem. There are manifestors of everybody else's problem. You know, it's usually the... Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it is a family issue. It's a family own, issue. Their own, I mean, I'll see a lot of kids who are adolescents who have been, have headaches, have been seen by neuro a very good neurologist, and, and or they have <laughs> abdominal pain, they have IBS. They've been seen by pediatric gastroenterologists who get that they have IBS, but if they try amitriptyline and that doesn't work, they're, they're stuck. Yeah. Um, and so, it, it, you know, that's why I couldn't take care of these patients. It, it takes a village. And so we have a team in the community of, I mean, both people at UCLA and in the community, but we've sort of, because I haven't, Develop, other than through research grants, develop the core infrastructure of budget to pay for a bunch of psychologists, child psychiatrists, physical therapists, music therapists, art therapists, traditional Chinese medicine specialists, etc. Then I work with people in the community, but it's the same group we've been working together for probably about 20 plus years. And we meet every Wednesday, even though there's some in the valley for people that live in the valley. And so we, we work as an integrative team. We communicate with each other. One won't tell the patient one thing. And, then, and if somebody's already seen somebody who's a who's traditional Chinese medicine in the community, I'll ask for permission to communicate with that person. Again, so we're working together. Um, and it's, it's singing the same song so that the model is still the same, even though they're looking at it from different aspects. Um, so let me just sort of go yeah, through, but yeah. we'll talk about all of that some more. Um, just hollow organ obstruction, certainly in cancer, and adults with cancer are often more 
and in kids, um, how a organ, you know, can be intestines, bladder, um, fallopian tubes, uterus, uh, think of the hollow organs in the body, and you get cramping typically. Um, and uh, if it's GI, often you get nausea, vomiting, um, partial bowel obstruction, bladder spasm, uh, bladder um, hemorrhagic cystitis from some of the chemotherapy drugs. Bone pain, people that have bone metastases or primary bone disease, often it's described as a, a deep, poorly localized aching. Uh, there may be narrow infiltration. And, you know, I have, um, just to use example, I, I see a number of adolescents or adults with sickle cell disease um, I, I see actually the kids <clears throat> at my children's hospital because they live in the San Salvador Center who have the worst pain problems who are, and if they're getting transfused every other week, that week before the transfusion when the hemoglobin drops, their bones are, and the marrow's trying to kick in and the bones are hurting. Um, so it's a feeling of pressure, aching, <coughs> Tender to palpation, especially if there's any periosteal elevation. And of course, they may get fractures and pathologic fractures and osteoporosis, etc. And arthritis pain is probably a combination of bone and nociceptive pain. So you have the inflammatory, but also if you have bone against bone, you're really talking about bone erosion. So it's that often that. Hurts, it hurts to touch, to press, to move, it, um, it feels gnawing, aching, <laughs> etc. So these are descriptors that, that people have used to uh, talk about these different kinds of pain. Then when we think of reasons for pain in both children and adults, as I said, in medical procedures in children is probably the biggest thing that kids hear the most that parents have the hardest time to know what to do. In the old days, um, they kids would come in and they would literally use the old days, you know, earlier in my training, um, they would hold the kid down, kid would be screaming, they would, you know, sort of several people, especially if it was an adolescent, and they would use a needle of uh, infiltrate the area with lidocaine, so that was another needle, and then they could do the bone marrow biopsy or bone marrow aspiration. And obviously there's a lot of trauma and development of central pain from these kinds of procedures. Um, so, and, and you know, we've changed it now, but in terms of pharmacologically, but um, <coughs> I think most hospitals now recognize that the preparation is childlike for the most part in preparing children and parents on what they can do to, um, to get through the procedures and that it won't bother them. And, uh, and not all kids need to be under general anesthesia. But there are a lot of procedures, especially in the emergency department, what are some good interventional strategies that are non-pharmacological? And I'll talk about that in the research. Um, talk about neuropathic pain, local, central, preferred. Uh, if you have something pressing on your diaphragm, you're going to feel that in your shoulder. If you had ischemia to your heart, you're going to feel it down your left arm. There's preferred it kidney you feel in your back, that they're referred areas based on um, what pathways are connecting to what in the interneurons and the dorsal lines. So um, those need to be addressed. And then of course what happens is you have, so you might have a tumor in the liver or some diaphragmatic involvement, you get shoulder pain, but then because you have the referred shoulder pain, then the muscles by your shoulder. So you have both local and 
heard from her. Um, visceral pain is probably the hardest to um, to localize and identify. First of all, it's hidden somewhere. Um, it's often scary because uh, that's why IBS and the other pain syndrome, etc., are um, patients know people know that there's something going on, and so of course, depending upon. or whatever they're imagining it, and their anxiety is going to play a larger role in amplifying that pain experience. <clears throat> Increasing anxiety, and we know that increased anxiety and increased sympathetic power, they're increasing the pain signaling volume. <clears throat> um, and then bone marrow transplant has its whole bag of unique kinds of mucositis, to graft versus host disease, um, tumor invasion, uh, you have brain metastases or primary brain tumor, you can have increased ventricular pressure, headaches, vomiting, and then sort of forgetting about the, which I think often you know, we'll see in some of the kids with them. That people are forgetting about the impact of anxiety, depression, fatigue, lack of sleep, you know, anemia, um, so you know, if you just give, and I think Kit talked about this, if you just give, if you treat the symptom, you just give pain medicine, what about these other things that are continuing to come into your life? Maybe you're making some of these things worse. Um, <clears throat> so, and that sort of brings me to talk about target outcomes, and I think, you know, again, I'm building on what Dr. Dewey talked about. So if we look at studies of the epidemiologic studies of fetuses and adults with cancer, um, across the board, about 64% report ongoing pain, separate from procedural outcomes. 75% report fatigue, and that could be related to radiation therapy, related to chemotherapy, related to anemia, related to lots of other things, you know, energy reserves gone, are depleted, and sleep disturbance, 72% in those three quarters. And so these are the most common individual symptoms, but they cluster together uh, at elevated levels in about 40% of people with cancer. Again, it's your studies and and clearly, if you think about the downstream effect, if these symptoms aren't addressed, then they can impact mood, function, adherence to cancer therapies, and just quality of life in general. Which also means when you look at research, what are the, what's the aim of the research? Is it how narrowly is it defined? How broadly? And then who's entering the study? So maybe people are, if pain is the outcome, maybe you're bringing in people who are ready, first of all, already have, we're not talking prevention, they're saying already have pain, and regardless of whether they also have other comorbidities, and so you're looking at pain as the outcome without necessarily, and then what they'll do in those studies is say, oh, also a secondary, we'll look at, at function, at, at uh, mood, depression, et cetera, sleep, but they may have not had problems. And I mean, it's a heterogeneous mix of, they're not coming in with problems already with mood and with sleep problems. And so it's a different, a little different population. Um, and then sort of the way that the single symptom focus in clinical treatment of people with cancer. So you're focusing on and typically, opioids are used uh, to treat pain because if people are certainly kids, if they're thrombocytopenic, you're not going to give them NSAIDs. Um, so you're, the typical thing to do would be Tylenol and then various levels of opioid. But somebody who's on 
opioids may have side effects from opioids and they may be higher during the day, which impacts functioning, cognition, impact mood. Um, they may be sleeping during the day, napping. Well, what happens at night if they're taking naps during the day is they may be up all night or you know have problems falling asleep or staying asleep or both. Um, and we know that just um, depriving people of stage four restorative sleep impacts pain signaling. So we know, and, and they did studies of well-conditioned um, astronauts, and they wanted to know sort of a while back what would happen if things were happening and astronauts had to stay up for three days in a row or three nights in a row. And so they had them in the sleep lab, and they would wake them up every time their brain pattern went into a stage four sleep. So they never got stage four sleep. They napped, but it was a light stage. Stage two, stage two is like, you know, like a top that's, you know, I just have metaphor, and it's about to fall, but it doesn't. It's about to, you know, where you're feeling you're tired and you feel like you're, you know, but you're not. Um, and what happened is by day three, they develop significant myofascial pain. Their muscles were hurting, they felt then um, fatigued, achy, their mood changed. I mean, and that was well-conditioned individuals who just were deprived of three nights of stage four sleep. So can you imagine somebody with cancer, let alone when they're in the hospital, let alone in the ICU, where they're being interrupted to get their various procedures done. And in the hospital, things tend to be done for hospital convenience rather than for individual convenience. So the lab tech may come in to draw blood, then person goes to sleep. 10 minutes later, the x-ray technician comes in. 10 minutes later, the team is rounding. And then, so there's almost an iatrogenic deprivation of sleep besides all the noise and the light. Um, and so what happens when we talk about just reserves? And, and you know, when you think about it in terms of sort of the whole model, that you're depleting somebody's reserves. So how are they going to respond to all of the insults that they're expected, including the environmental stimuli uh, that they're expected? And, and then, you know, the sort of model of allostatic stress load when the body starts breaking down. So, um, I'm going to talk about a large um, meta-analysis of studies in adults with cancer that looked at um, these specific integrative therapies integrative because it was in addition to their cancer treatment. And, and these were, they looked at all the studies that described a relaxation protocol as the uh, complementary therapy. Hypnosis imagery, uh, they lumped together cognitive behavior therapy and coping skills training, meditation, mindfulness, music therapy and virtual reality. And you know, again, these were the, the complementary therapies that were looked at in this large meta-analysis. And I'm pointing to this study because it also looked at the idea of symptom clusters. And what of these studies, what was the focus, in and, and in particular, in particular, they looked at the pain, fatigue, sleep symptom cluster, because that was the most co-varying of, um, of the symptoms that tended to hang together, and where impact in one would have an impact on the other. Um, and what they found was, surprisingly, despite sort of a clinical common sense of this, that none of the studies tested the intervention that they were looking at in cancer patients specifically for this triad. So they would pick one and, oh, by the way, look at the others. Um, 
And, um, and in fact, as they looked at these, they began to accumulate across studies sufficient evidence to suggest that, in fact, an integrative approach can be efficacious for the full symptom cluster. And they argue that one needs to look at all of that up front, as well as downstream effects of mood and anxiety, et cetera. Um, and what they found looking at the studies that looked at pain, that looked at sleep, that looked at fatigue is that relaxation across studies had significant effects on pain and on sleep disturbance. And again, some of these studies didn't look at fatigue, so we don't know if it also had an effect on fatigue. They found that music studies looking at music intervention, and that's, I can get into a whole thing about what's playing music, what's music therapy, those are very different and what kind of music and how it's used, that's me. But that music can reduce pain and fatigue. And that hypnosis or guided imagery and the CBT, CST were the only interventions that seemed to have powerful effects on all three symptoms. So, um, Maybe before I get into um, what's the literature on complementary integrative therapies in children and adults, um, any thoughts about how you might design a study in, a, let's say, a group of adults with cancer who, um, like, how do you decide what are, you can't have 15 major outcomes because your sample size and your population, in defining the, pop, the target population is going to be complicated. So how do you decide what are going to be your primary, when you're designing your study, your primary outcomes? Thoughts? Well, Emily, you just uh, gone through almost a year and a half. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I was going to say, I was like, well, it's really what you care about. It really should be, but in practicality, sometimes it's what they think is that they can power the study to find, and that's actually the wrong way to go about it. But, but I mean, out of practical reasons, sometimes that's what they end up doing. Well, so there's the difference between the scientist's idea of what's important and often that's what's most findable by NIH, what the study section is going to look at, how we clean, well designed, and also what has from prior studies the greatest effect size so that you can, your power, you can get away with fewer subjects to get sufficient power in whatever design you use. If one thinks about even all the way out to the choreograms, one can look at what is the, the stakeholder feel is most important. So maybe they have pain or they're not sleeping, but it's the fatigue that bothers them the most. So one could design a study <clears throat> with the outcome or cluster of outcomes that's most important to the stakeholder and try to come up with a good enough study to address that and look at satisfaction, symptom change, and adoption of whatever that intervention is, lifestyle change, et cetera. So when you look at research, it's important to see how the outcomes, the primary outcome, were decided upon the study, um, which also, if you look at some studies that had large attrition, that could be because it was this, the intervention was too burdensome, or the outcome, primary outcome, wasn't important enough to the stakeholder, even though they entered the study. I mean, there, so there are a lot of reasons for attrition. Um, I'm just going to go so we, we can end soon. Um, so 
This was a, a Cochrane review, and we've already talked about some of the problems in the Cochrane reviews for that. But this was, and again, if you're submitting a grant, an intervention study to NIH, you have to go through the political steps of doing your Cochrane, you know, looking through your literature review, let them know you've done it, and then if you want to deviate from what's there, you have to build a good rationale to do that. Um, so it makes sense. So this was the large Cochrane review that Chris Chambers and her group did, published in 2006. And they ended up looking at 30, and this was for uh, pain in uh, pain in children with children with cancer. So, um, uh, and this study that they did was just looking at medical procedure pain because most of the study. I mean, my first study on medical procedure pain was published in 1982. So, and that was before all of the modern pharmacologic treatments. And so we looked at hypnotherapy compared to distraction, compared to treatment as usual. One of the things about environment I have to say about that study is, in the clinic we did this, we, the, the research associates who were collecting the data were blind to the subject group. The nurses in the clinic were blind to the subject group. And what we were finding was in year three of our study, baseline ratings of pain, anxiety, were very significantly lower than year one. And so, gee, why is that near videotape? And we started looking at coding the videotape. The nurses were adopting, I mean, not, we didn't teach them anything, but they were adopting the interventions we were using, and that became, by year three, the natural practice of the clinic, and it was effective in the sense that kids entering in year three, their baseline was significantly lower than when they were starting the study. So the environment that you're doing your study in can change along the way. And, and unless you're accounting for that and looking at that, you're going to say, gee, I, you know, most of your kids were recruited in year three. I don't really have a significant effect. Or they're all doing well. But they were doing well at baseline. So I mean, so one needs so to. So that's why you know it's more than just inter-rater variability. It can go up to the inter-rater and environment yeah. variability exactly. as well. I mean, it depends on if exactly. you're doing a multi-center trial. You know, besides training everyone as if they are going to be doing the same thing, you want to make sure that the environment are similar too. I mean, it's difficult. I'll tell you, research is so difficult. Clinical research. But it's fun. It's so fun. We'll do it. <laughs> I've done enough of What's it. What's the alternative? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, and, and what they found was these were the interventions that were looked at, I mean, that were studied um, for uh, medical procedure, needle related pain in kids with cancer. So, there were studies on aromatherapy, art therapy, distraction, hypnosis, physical activity and positioning, touch therapy and then a multimodal cognitive behavioral therapy. And in fact, all the studies, and this was published in 2006, were generally, um, uh, there were varying, varying levels of um, expertise, of, of quality in the study. And it was in two, the most recent updated one that Jib and group did that was just published this past year uh, looked at um, complementary therapy clinical trials in kids with cancer more broadly. And what they found was that 69% of the studies uh, reported that their outcomes show their intervention prevented or reduced pain intensity. And in fact, though, the studies that they reviewed, again, looking at all the, the databases, the PubMed, and all the usual, they described how they looked at the, you know, how they did the review, um, were poor quality because I think some of it is the difficulty, if, if you look at the studies, in doing sort of single, I, you're, I think as Kit talked about, there are so many different variables that 
it's n not that easy. And if you use in children, if you use children age five to eighteen, I mean, think about all the developmental levels and measures. Um, but the ones that really came out over and over as being effective were distraction and hypnosis. And again, mindfulness was not studied. I mean, there's certain things that were not studied. Um, acupuncture for for nausea and vomiting in kids was studied. <coughs> in fact, to be you don't want to need but, <laughs> but for medical procedure pain, there were no studies. So it doesn't mean it wasn't effective, it means it wasn't studied. Um, and then in adults, um, there are certainly Lorenzo Cohn at um, uh, MD Anderson Hospital has done a lot of studies of yoga and then others. So, um, and they there were studies in the literature for mood and anxiety disorders using meditation, yoga, relaxation with imagery, and for pain the studies <clears throat> uh, looked at um, energy enhancement, sleep enhancement for pain associated with chemotherapy massage and healing touch associated for chemotherapy related pain, music therapy, especially for surgical pain, uh, physical training with mind-body modality for surgical pain in one large breast cancer study. And again, um, because of the, the methodology, at least the, the article reported the uh, effectiveness of acupuncture for pain, is unknown, again, I think, you know, we're talking about how the studies were designed with that and what the expectation was. And Actually, I think that uh, I, it was uh, 2009. I was in Shanghai. I think Coleman did a study, actually, of the uh, Fudan tumor hospital. I think that may be a study. I mean, I think that it was not a positive study. But again, it's how it's done, what the expectations are, the cultural <clears throat> expectations. If you do a study in China where people are used to acupuncture, maybe, and they, the expectations versus in Iowa, well, especially before Houston, the Iowa Houston. caucus, well, you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they uh, the outcomes may be very different, even with the same study. That's what I'm saying. So, you just label a disease and then say, oh, you don't look at the person. Right, exactly. The person centered approach is pretty important to know what yeah. you are studying yeah. of the disease of that person. Okay. Um, so I just want to hit briefly, maybe for five minutes and a little bit for discussion. Um, when you think about setting up your research study in general, what do you have to think about? And certainly, what are the reviewers going to review? study section if you want to try to get NIH funding here for your study. Well, there's a whole, you know, in terms of subject selection. So are you picking out a convenient sample? Um, there are studies where the, because I know it's a while where NIH or reviewers wanted, you know, kids just in this age with this type of leukemia and you pick it so defined you can't get a large enough sample to do your study. But also, I remember the acupuncture pent off uh, study in kids with migraines um, that was done you know, a long time ago. Um, he defined for study entry those kids that had migraines but were not on any migraine medication. Well, most kids who have migraines are taking something and they're doing something. And so whatever the finding, putting it into the real world, it's, uh, you know, we don't know. And, um, and so, you know, I think subject selection is really important. And also it's important thinking about subject attrition because if you're going to pick your subjects from a wide geographic area, but your intervention requires them to come to UCLA to get the intervention. Well, you can already know you're gonna get subject attrition from the realities of people trying to get here and back and 
and adding the extra time from their daily schedule. To but say, you just recruitment. I mean, we have a tough time recruiting just because they're coming to New Zealand, talking, right. and pay for it. It's right. Exactly. And then there's just, um, I mean, that's what, you know, in terms of subject recruitment. And um, that's why we always look at how many people were invited to the study, how many accepted to go into the study, how many actually went in the study, and how long did they last in the study over time. And you want to look at are the study refusers, you know, people who were offered the study, who met criteria offered but didn't choose to participate, is that group very different from your acceptors? Because the acceptors may be a very different subgroup of individuals, which also may mean that your intervention might be very effective with people with this characteristic, but not with this characteristic. So that's important. Um, and then, you know, so you talk about bias and attrition, and that's going to have a role in your data analysis. So. If you only analyze the data at the end of uh, three-month intervention with the 30 people that remained in the study and the 100 people who dropped out, you're just not including, you may get a very different outcome than if you look at you know, the different points along the study. And also, that helps you with some dose effect. So, and then just general, this is, you know, Research 101, uh, but you know, study design issues. So, normally people start out with a single arm study. You know, do you want to feasibility? Do you want to do this? Does it work? Will people come to the table when you call? You know, um, will they do it? Do you see any pre post, even though you don't know all the sources of what might have led to change? You know, is there anything pre-post? So that's sort of your first, and then, and you may do several of those as you develop iterate, different iterations of the intervention. Then you got the intervention down that you want to test out, and then there's the whole question about do you start out with a, a pilot randomized control for study, the, the treatment intervention versus treating, treatment as usual, which is usually R21, the first randomized. Well, you know, a lot of people will do it as a waiting list control so that everybody will feel like they're going to get the intervention because otherwise you're going to get much more attrition in your treatment as usual arm than in the intervention arm, or you may. So one does that. Then there's the whole question of study treatment versus attention control. So attention meaning you're part of the study, you're getting, uh, you know, it's like the placebo arm. You're interacting with the study personnel, you're getting data collected, and there's an effect of, uh, there's a positive response, whether it's with a, a placebo drug or whether it's the, uh, whatever the therapy is, psychological, acupuncture, et cetera. Um, and then the whole question is, what constitutes a good attention control? And that's where, you know, initially, as Kit talked about, the studies used to be acupuncture versus sham acupuncture. And they found, well, actually, needling has an effect. So then it was, as, as Kit's last study, actual, actual acupuncture, maybe sham acupuncture, so needling somewhere else. And then placebo needling, where the needle didn't get inserted, but the patients thought they were getting the acupuncture, and everything was like the acupuncture, except they didn't get the needle. So there are all of these, and, and as part of this, you have to look at, um, uh, what's the term for it? You know, you have to find out how individuals, what they believe they were getting. Uh, and did they believe what was their expectation of participating in the study and study outcome from the start? What did they believe they were getting if it was a three-arm study? Which arm did they think they were in? And if they felt like they weren't getting the real, the real thing, that obviously can impact their outcome. So um, fidelity, I guess we'll call it. And, and fidelity is also 
is the deliverable in each of the groups remaining as planned throughout the study? Because that can change over time. So there are all these um, things to consider. And then, um, you know, as Kit talked about, comparative effectiveness. So let's say we, we say opioids for cancer pain. The studies that this opioid or that opioid, okay, that this is, this shows this effect. Well, what about an opioid in a comparative effective study to acupuncture? So the acupuncture either has to do as good as the opioid trial or better, or if it's as good as, is it more convenient? Does it cost less? Does it, what are the advantages? So these are sort of where people are moving into comparative effectiveness. I will say that you need a larger sample size for a comparative effectiveness study. Um, and then just lastly, issues related to data analysis. Obviously, how do you handle missing data? How do you, you know, you need to include all the patients who enrolled, even if they dropped out. And then the whole issue of mediators and moderators. You know, does mediator is, you know, if this intervention works on this outcome through changing, you know, works on Y through changing X. It's mediated through X. Whereas an interaction, or the moderator, it's an interaction. So A and B, A will influence the amount of B. It might increase it or decrease it or alter it in some way. And that's, it's not going through it, but it's, it's influencing it which then influences the outcome. Um, and then I, I'm just going to, this is more fun type stuff. I just, um, I'm going to go through some pictures of kids with different complementary therapies. Um, and these aren't all of them, obviously. Um, starting with acupuncture, I have the same picture that Kit showed. <laughs> but remembering that there's a reason we need research it says you got to be kidding, your back still hurts five million needles later. But again, that expectation that I'm going to the acupuncturist and that's going to make me all better. Well, they're acupuncturists and acupuncturists. So there's, you know, just as they're doctors who did pills and other doctors who did pills. Um, so massage, and there's research on massage and neonates. Um, and Tiffany Peel did a lot of the research on and looked at, again, biomarkers of change, um, looked at premature infants who, uh, you know, did they gain weight faster in their neonatal life? So I think it's better even, so that's kids, but what happens to I get it every week? Oh, <laughs> so yeah, I, just, I do. I'm saying, as, as Helen said, <clears throat> all of these things I personally, you know, I do yoga, mindful meditation, I meditate, I get, get massages, get acupuncture. <laughs> You so, can do this work without all that. Right. You, know? you can experience it. Right? Yeah, but also right. stress reduction for yourself. But also there's, in the hospital, there are kids that like to be touched and kids that don't. And uh, I think the importance of kids that are more developmentally sensory sensitive, uh, kids on the autism spectrum, yeah. Yeah. They're, um, and kids who have had been um, molested, sexually abused, to go in and touch them, they really are touch avoidant. And so it's really important, you can't just assume that everybody loves massage, because I love massage, but you know, knowing, again, who gets what in, in all of this. Um, I can't even see that art, music therapy, and there are all kinds of studies related to drum circles, and we did a study of drum it. circles in the school, elementary school, it was just a, and, um, and just looked at um, test scores in the classes that had, you know, right after lunch, they would have a 20 minute drum circle. And the kids over the year uh, who were in the groups that had the drum circle, they had more concentration, I mean, interviews with the teachers and the kids and parents and then looking at grades, they did better in the groups that had the, the 20 minute drum circle, whether it was just getting together, communicating with each other, connectedness, 
mindfulness. I mean, there are a lot of. Are they getting lots of getting lots of stress? It's like stress. Stress. Yeah. yeah stress. Music. Music. I mean, I just like I asked my adults to just hit the sandbag. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hit the wall. Hit the sandbag. <laughs> well, what's interesting is. But that also, it's learning. You know, it's not an it's easy right. task. So it's some cognitive analysis. There's also it's a, it's a sound affects the brain too. It's kind of a little so, yeah. the sound therapy too. Well, there's a difference between even in what aspects of the brain get activated in listening to music, and then the type of music, and participating in music. Whether you're singing, whether your body's moving, whether you're playing an instrument, mm -hmm. um, and and it's it's terrific. I just gave an interview. Actually, people are very interested in the newspaper reporters in sound healing. And it's been the one after another, and they are all interested what kind of music uh, mm -hmm. is participatory listening, and uh, it's a huge field, you know, I'm just getting into oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. But I studied chanting meditations, you know, oh, and in, uh, 20 minute meditation, similar things. Mm -hmm. But it's a, a number of things that play a role mm -hmm. uh, to cognitive, into mm -hmm. cognitive enhancement, stress reduction, mm -hmm. uh, a community. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. now I'm I'm about to submit a grant on couple meditation, couple meditation in couples with one partner being depressed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and just to say, clinically, you know, when I've had kids who are on the spectrum who are non-communicative, yeah. and it, it just this kind of, I kind of came on this again. It hasn't been studied, but as a fluke. Our craniosacral therapist way back when also played the major key, which is a, an instrument. Yeah. And he, as he explained, it's continuous sound because you learn how to capture air while you're blowing out, and they are through the nose, so that then you're blowing out again. So it's a continuous sound. It's not. And I started, and I had him work with some of our kids who were on the spectrum who were non communicative and self-injurious behaviors, et cetera, and they would just calm down. And, they were, and, and it just had some kind of effect. Of course, he didn't know processes. And so, and then of course after he left, I didn't have my local didgeridoo player. And so I had parents start to get uh, DVDs of didgeridoo music. And they were seeing it worked. It even worked in kids who had different syndromes who were deaf. Um, because you could feel the vibration. The vibration. Yeah. So again, that's you know how one looks at what might be useful and testing that out. I didn't do research on that, but. and then biofeedback is using some sort of um, bodily system, feedback system, whether it's temperature, uh, muscle tension, skin temperature, etc to give signals and then you learn sort of the cognitive intervention, the mindfulness, the imagery that gives you the, the signals your brain kind of learns what it needs to do. Um, and then there's all kinds of other stuff and aromatherapy, uses of music, <coughs> distraction, art therapy, pet therapy in the hospital. And I sat on an NIH study section at a large um, animal food company sponsored. Gave money to NIH and said, do research on pet there, on something related to pets and humans. And so there were veterinarians on the study section. There were and guys. Interesting. The company <coughs> gave money to NIH rather than go into UCLA or whatever. And that's kind of it was, a, this is new. No, I know. It was, you know, and so Which I, company was this? Pet. That's a pet um, company. It's a known company. This was a number of years ago. Um, oh, I don't remember, yeah. but it was. They haven't done it since then. Uh -huh. but, but it was interesting that the most of the research that was submitted, you know, as a program announcement, was all on kids that had fear of animals, and it wasn't on sort of the therapeutic effects of. It's like an exposure, exposure yeah. therapy. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> if not, probably most of my um, research has been in the past on um, hypnosis, hypnotic uh, interventions, and looking at the effect of hypnosis on pain, on anxiety, on 
biological stress responses, um, cancer, um, survivors, and fatigue, and, um, <coughs> uh, and nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy. We have a study going on now looking at um, effective hypnosis, you know, 20 minute hypnotic intervention in the lab in uh, older adolescents and young adults with sickle cell disease. And um, and looking at blood flow and uh, stress response and see if you can alter blood flow and um, convert to controls without sickle cell disease or the same socioeconomic racial group to uh, see if the differences in response and then obviously taking that and playing that out in the community. Um, and then yoga, that's the other, we've had a long time yoga program, and <clears throat> the type of yoga we've used is called a Yangar yoga, and again, it's um, body poses, uh, pranayama breathing, and mindfulness, and <clears throat> I sort of describe it to kids as a mindfulness of the body, it's when you're in a pose, you're in that pose basically learning to just And again, there are very different poses for the very first study we did back in a long time ago was with a graduate student in psychology to look at the effects on, um, on depression in college students and significant effects as far well as secondary positive effects on sleep um, So what are the challenges? Slide. I think part of it is how do you, you know, how do you look at a complex system in a complex environment that's changing, <clears throat> and where people's needs change over time. So what their need was at month one of the study may be very different by month three because of whatever else is happening in their life, um, and the idea it's the while there are different techniques studied, there really isn't a lot of integrative therapy studied, sort of whole models in people with cancer. Um, and I, I think the goal is which therapies are effective for whom, when, in what dose, um, in what context, and then finally timing in relation to treatment. Um, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing it. work. You know, and, and clearly you're enjoying it, so yeah. it's the most it's important fun. thing. <laughs> and again, you have to do it all yourself. Like, you know, if you're if you're a meditator, how could somebody not do that? It's so positive. You know, with mindfulness, though, there are all sorts of people getting into it just because it became a buzzword. Right, right, right. You know, who have no clue, no appreciation for what it might do. Exactly. And I think it's doing a disservice. I, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> well, thank you so much, thank Helen, so for, much for orchestrating this. Great. And I think that uh, it's a good way for us uh, to, uh, you know, uh, Get together share, share our, God, you know, many years of uh, our journey in research <laughs> with uh, yeah. other people who uh, may not be aware of uh, the and complexity. And I hope, yes, the trainees will let us know what was, uh, resonated, those who are watching at uh, a distant uh, learning. And uh, I'll let you know what happens. Thank okay. you so much Thank for you. coming in. Thank you. Thank you. It's in the uh, recycle bin. I mean, you will look at the, take it out. But I don't know how to empty your recycle bin. So I know it's tough for you. It's uh, it's jet lag. You have to like, you know, something in the car. What? You have to take.